The Second Part of Henry the Fourth by William Shakespeare. Induction. Scene. England. Warkworth. Before Northumberland's Castle. Enter Rumor. Painted full of tongues. Open your ears! For which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumour speaks? I, from the Orient to the drooping West, making the wind my post-horse, still unfold the acts commenced on this ball of earth. Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. And who but rumour, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepared defence, whilst the big year, swollen with some other grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war in no such matter? Rumour is a pipe blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and if so easy, and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, the still discordant wavering multitude, can play upon it. But what need I thus my well-known body to anatomize among my household? Why is rumour here? I run before King Harry's victory, who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion even with the rebel's blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? <laughs> My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword, and that the king before the Douglas rage stooped his anointed head as low as death. This have I rumoured through the peasant towns between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone, where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. The posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learnt of me. <laughs> From rumours' tongues they bring smooth comforts, false, worse than true wrongs. <laughs> Exit. Scene one. Warkworth, before Northumberland's castle. Enter Lord Bardolph. Who keeps the gate here? Ho! The porter opens the gate. Where is the earl? What should I say you are? Tell thou the earl that the lord Bardolph doth attend him here. His lordship is walked forth into the orchard. Please it, your honour, knock but at the gate, and he himself will answer. Enter Northumberland. Here comes the earl. Exit porter. What news, Lord Bardolph? Every minute now should be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild. Contention like a horse, full of high feeding, madly hath broke loose and bears down all before him. Noble earl, I bring you certain news from Shrewsbury. Good and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death, and in the fortune of my lord your son... Prince Harry slain outright, and both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field, and Harry Monmouth's brawn, the Hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Oh, such a day, so fought, so followed, and so fairly won, came not till now to dignify the times since Caesar's fortunes. How is this derived? Saw you the field? Came you from Shrewsbury? I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence, a gentleman, well-bred and of good name, that freely rendered me these news for true. Enter Travers. Here comes my servant, Travers, whom I sent on Tuesday last to listen after news. My lord, I overrode him on the way, and he is furnished with no certainties more than he haply may retail from me. Now, Travers, what good tidings comes with you? My lord, Sir John Umfrevel turned me back with joyful tidings, and, being better horsed, outrode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman, almost forspent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his bloodied horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand one news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had bad luck, and that young Harry Percy's spur was cold. With that he gave his able horse the head, and bending forward, struck his armoured heels against the panting sides of his poor jade up to the rowel head, and starting so he seemed in running to devour the way, staying no longer question. Huh! 
again? Said he young Harry Percy's spur was cold? Of hot spur, cold spur? That rebellion hath met ill luck? My lord, I'll tell you what. If my young lord your son have not the day, upon mine honor, for a silken point I'll give my barony. Never talk of it. Why should that gentleman that rode by Travers give then such instances of loss? Who, he? He was some hilding fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on, and upon my life spoke at a venture. Look, here comes more news. Enter Morton. Yea, this man's brow, like to a title leaf foretells the nature of a tragic volume. So looks the strand whereon the imperious flood hath left a witnessed usurpation. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? <sighs> I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where hateful death puts on his ugliest mask to fright our party. How doth my son and brother? Thou tremblest, and the whiteness in thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. Even such a man, so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dread in look, so woe-begone, drew Priam's curtain in the dead of night, and would have told him half his Troy was burnt. But Priam found the fire ere he his tongue, and I, my Percy's death, ere thou reportst it. This thou wouldst say, your son did thus and thus, your brother thus, so fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise, ending with brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living, and your brother yet. But for my lord your son... Why, he is dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes that what he feared is chanced. Yet speak, Morton, tell thou an earl his divination lies, and I will take it as a sweet disgrace and make thee rich for doing me such wrong. You are too great to be by me gainsaid. Your spirit is too true, your fears too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy's dead. I see a strange confession in thine eye. Thou shakest thy head and holdst it in fear or sin to speak a truth. If he be slain, say so. The tongue offends not that reports his death, and he doth sin that doth belie the dead, not he which says the dead is not alive. Yet the first bringer of unwelcome news hath but a losing office, and his tongue sounds ever after as a sullen bell, remembered tolling a departing friend. I cannot think, my lord, your son is dead. I'm sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed, to Harry Monmouth whose swift wrath beat down the never-daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprang up. In few, his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, being bruited once, took fire and heat away from the best-tempered courage in his troops. For from his metal was his party steeled, which once in him abated, and the rest turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead. And as the thing that's heavy in itself upon enforcement flies with greatest speed, so did our men, heavy in Hotspur's loss, lend to this weight such lightness with their fear that arrows fled not swifter toward their aim than did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. Then was that noble Worcester soon taken prisoner, and that furious Scot, the bloody Douglas, whose well-labouring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king, gan veil his stomach and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs, and in his flight, stumbling in fear, was took. The sum of all is that the king hath won, 
and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. This is the news at full. For this I shall have time enough to mourn. In poison there is physic, and these news, having been well, that would have made me sick, being sick, have in some measure made me well. And as the wretch whose fever weakened joints, like strengthless hinges, buckle under life, impatient of his fit, breaks like a fire out of his keeper's arms, even so my limbs, weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, are thrice themselves. Hence, therefore, thou nice crutch, a scaly gauntlet now with joints of steel must glove this hand, and hence, thou sickly quaff, thou art a guard too wanton for the head, which princes, fleshed with conquest, aim to hit. Now bind my brows with iron, and approach the raggedest hour that time and spite dare bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland. Let heaven kiss earth, now let not nature's hand keep the wild flood confined. Let order die, and let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. But let one spirit of the firstborn, Cain, reign in all bosoms, that each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude scene may end, and darkness be the barrier of the dead. This strained passion doth you wrong, my lord. Sweet Earl, divorce not wisdom from your honour. The lives of all your loving complices lean on your health, the which, if you give o'er to stormy passion, must perforce decay. You cast the event of war, my noble lord, and summed the account of chance before you said, Let us make head. It was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. You knew he walked o'er perils on an edge, more likely to fall in than to get o'er. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars, and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger ranged. Yet did you say, Go forth! And none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff-born action. What have then befallen, or what have this bold enterprise brought forth, more, than that being which was like to be. We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we wrought out life t'was ten to one. And yet we ventured, for the gain proposed choked the respect of likely peril feared. And since we are o'erset, venture again. Come, we will put forth body and goods. Tis more than time. And, my most noble lord, I hear for certain and dare speak the truth. The gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who with a double surety binds his followers. My lord your son had only but the corpse, but shadows and the shows of men to fight. For that same word, rebellion, did divide the action of their bodies from their souls. And they did fight with queasiness, constrained as men drink potions, that their weapons only seemed on our side, but for their spirits and souls, this word rebellion, it had froze them up, as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to religion. Suppose sincere and holy in his thoughts, he's followed both with body and with mind, and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard scraped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause, tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land gasping for life under great bolling brook, and more and less do flock to follow him. I knew of this before, but to speak truth, this present grief hath wiped it from my mind. Go in with me, and counsel every man the aptest way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters, and make friends with speed, never so few, and never yet more need. Exeunt. Scene 2. London. A street. Enter Sir John Falstaff with his page bearing his sword and buckler. 
Sirrah, you giant! What says the doctor to my water? He said, sir, the water itself was a good healthy water, but for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. Men of all sorts take a pride to gird at me. The brain of this foolish compounded clay man is not able to invent anything that intends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. I do here walk before thee like a sow that hath overwhelmed all her litter but one. If the prince put thee into my service for any other reason than to set me off, why then I have no judgment. Thou whoreson mandrake, thou art fitter to be worn in my cap than to wait at my heels. I was never manned with an agate till now. But I will inset you neither in gold nor silver, but in vile apparel, and send you back again to your master, for a jewel, the juvenile, the prince, your master, whose chin is not yet fledge. I will sooner have a beard grow in the palm of my hand than he shall get one off his cheek, and yet he will not stick to say his face is a face royal. God may finish it when he will. "'Tis not a hair amiss yet. "'He may keep it still at a face royal, "'for a barber shall never earn sixpence out of it. "'And yet he'll be crowing as if he had writ man "'ever since his father was a bachelor. "'He may keep his own grace, "'but he's almost out of mine, I can assure him. "'What said Master Domelton about the satin "'for my short cloak and my slops?' He said, sir, you should procure him better assurance than Bardolph. He would not take his band and yours. He liked not the security. Let him be damned, like the glutton. Pray God his tongue be hotter. O her son Achitophel, a rascal, yea, forsooth, knave, to bear a gentleman in hand, and then stand upon security. The whore son smooth pates do now wear nothing but high shoes, and bunches of keys at their girdles. And if a man is through with them in honest taking up, then they must stand upon security. I had as lief they would put ratsbane in my mouth as offer to stop it with security. I looked as should have sent me two and twenty yards of satin, as I am a true knight, and he sends me security. Well, he may sleep in security, for he hath the horn of abundance, and the lightness of his wife shines through it. "'and yet cannot he see, though we have his own lantern to light him. "'Where's Bardolph?' "'He's gone into Smithfield to buy your worship horse.' "'I bought him in Paul's, and he'll buy me a horse in Smithfield, "'and I could get me but a wife in the stews. "'I were manned, horsed, and wived.' "'Enter the Lord Chief Justice and Servant.' "'Sir, here comes the nobleman that committed the prince "'for striking him about Bardolph.' "'Wait close. I will not see him.' What's he that goes there? Falstaff, and please your lordship. He that was in the question for the robbery? He, my lord, but he has since done good service at Shrewsbury, and, as I hear, is now going with some charge to the Lord John of Lancaster. What? To Jock? Call him back again. Sir John Falstaff. Boy, tell him I am deaf. You must speak louder. My master is deaf. I am sure he is to the hearing of anything good. Go pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Sir John! What? A young knave and begging? Is there not wars? Is there not employment? Doth not the king lack subjects? Do not the rebels need soldiers? And though it be a shame to be on any side but one, it is worse shame to beg than to be on the worst side, for it worse than the name of rebellion can tell how to make it. You mistake me, sir. Why, sir, did I say you were an honest man? Setting my knighthood and my soldiership aside, I had lied in my throat if I had said so. I pray you, sir, then set your knighthood and your soldiership aside, and give me leave to tell you, you in your throat, if you say that I am any other than an honest man. I give thee leave to tell me so, 
I lay aside that which grows to me. If thou gettest any leave of me, hang me. If thou takest leave, thou wert better be hanged. You hunt counter, hence of aught. Sir, my lord would speak with you. Sir John Falstaff, a word with you. My good lord, God give your lordship good time of day. I am glad to see your lordship abroad. I heard say your lordship was sick. I hope your lordship goes abroad by advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, hath yet some smack of age in you, some relish of the saltness of time, and I most humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverent care of your health. Sir John, I send for you before your expedition to Shrewsbury. And please, your lordship, I hear his majesty is returned with some discomfort from Wales. I talk not of his majesty. You would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness is fallen into this same horse and apoplexy. Well, God mend him. I pray you let me speak with you. This apoplexy, as I take it, is a kind of lethargy, and please your lordship, a kind of sleeping in the blood, a wholesome tingling. What tell you me of it? Be it as it is. It hath it original from much grief, from study, and perturbation of the brain. I have read the cause of his effects in Galen. It is a kind of deafness. I think you are fallen into the disease for you hear not what I say to you. Very well, my lord, very well. Rather, and please you, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking, that I am troubled with all. To punish you by the heels would amend the attention of your ears, and I care not if I do become your physician. I am as poor as Job, my lord, but not so patient. Your lordship may minister the potion of imprisonment to me in respect of poverty, but how I should be your patient to follow your prescriptions, otherwise may make some dram of a scruple, or indeed a scruple itself. I sent for you when there were matters against you for your life, to come speak with me. As I was then advised by my learned counsel in the laws of this land service, I did not come. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. He that buckles himself in my belt cannot live in less. Your means are very slender, and your waste is great. I would it were otherwise. I would my means were greater, and my waste slenderer. You have misled the youthful prince. The young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly, and he my dog. Well, I am loath to gall a new-healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's exploit on Gladshill. You may thank the unique time for your quiet o'er as posting that action. Uh, my lord— But since all is well, keep it so. Wake not a sleeping wolf. To wake a wolf is as bad as smell a fox. What you are as a candle, the better part burnt out. A wassail candle, my lord, all tallow. If I did say of wax, my growth would approve the truth. There is not a white hair in your face but should have his effect of gravity. His effect of gravy, gravy. You follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. Not so, my lord, your ill angel is light, but hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. And yet, in some respects, I grant I cannot go, I cannot tell. The virtue is of so little regard in these costermongers' times that true valour is turned barad. Pregnancy is made a tapster, and his quick wit wasted in giving reckonings. All the other gifts appurtenant to man— as the malice of this age shapes them, are not worth a gooseberry. You that are old, consider not the capacities of us that are young. You do measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your galls, and we that are in the vayward of our youth must confess our wags too.
do you set down your name in the scroll of youth that are written down old with all the characters of age have you not a moist eye a dry hand a yellow cheek a white beard a decreasing leg and increasing belly is not your voice broken your wind short your chin double your wit single and every part about you blasted with antiquity and will you yet call yourself young fie fie sir john my lord i was born about three of the clock in the afternoon with a white head and something around belly for my voice i have lost it with hallooing and singing of anthems to approve my youth further i will not the truth is i am only old in judgment and understanding and he that will caper with me for a thousand marks let him lend me the money and have at him for the box of the ear that the prince gave you he gave it like a rude prince and you took it like a sensible lord i have checked him for it and the young lion repents mary not in ashes and sackcloth but in new silk and old sack well god send the prince a better companion god send the companion a better prince i cannot rid my hands of him well the king has served you i hear you are going with lord john of lancaster against the archbishop and the earl of northumberland yea i thank your pretty sweet wit for it but look you pray all you that kiss my lady peace at home that our armies join not in a hot day for by the lord i take but two shirts out with me and i mean not to sweat extraordinarily if it be a hot day and i brandish anything but a bottle i would i might never spit white again there is not a dangerous action can peep out his head but i am thrust upon it well i cannot last ever but it was always yet the trick of our english nation if they have a good thing to make it too common if he will need say i am an old man you should give me rest i would to god my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is i were better to be eaten to death with a rust than to be scoured to nothing with perpetual motion well be honest be honest and god bless your expedition will your lordship lend me a thousand pounds to furnish me forth not a penny not a penny you are too impatient to bear crosses fare you well commend me to my cousin westmoreland exeunt chief justice and servant if i do fill up me with a three-man beetle a man can no more separate age and covetousness than it can part young limbs and lechery but the gout galls the one and the pox pinches the other and so both the degrees prevent my curses boy sir what money is in my purse seven groats and tuppence i can get no remedy against this consumption of the purse borrowing only lingers and lingers it out but the disease is incurable go bear this letter to my lord of lancaster this to the prince this to the earl of westmoreland and this to old mistress ursula whom i have weakly sworn to marry since i perceived the first white hair of my chin about it you know where to find me exit page a pox of this gout nor a gout of this pox for the one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe tis no matter if i do halt i have the wars for my colour and my pension shall seem the more reasonable a good wit will make use of anything i will turn diseases to commodity Exit. Scene three. York, the Archbishop's Palace. Enter the Archbishop, Thomas Mowbray, the Earl Marshal, Lord Hastings, and Lord Bardolph. Thus have you heard our cause and known our means, and my most noble friends, I pray you all, speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. And first, Lord Marshal, what say you to it? I will allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves 
to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and puissance of the king. Our present musters grow upon the file to five and twenty thousand men of choice, and our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with an incensed fire of injuries. The question, then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus, whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland. With him we may. Yea, Mary, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand. For, in a theme so bloody-faced as this, conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids incertain should not be admitted. "'Tis very true, Lord Bardolph, for indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury." "'It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, eating the air and promise of supply, flattering himself in project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts, and so, with great imagination proper to madmen, led his powers to death, and, winking, leapt into destruction." "'But, by your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope?' Yes, if this present quality of war, indeed the instant action a cause on foot, lives so in hope, as in an early spring we see the appearing buds, which, to prove fruit, hope gives not so much warrant, as despair that frosts will bite them. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model, and when we see the figure of the house, then we must rate the cost of the erection, which, if we find out ways ability, what do we do then but draw anew the model in fewer offices, or at least desist to build at all? Much more, in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation and the model, consent upon a sure foundation, question surveyors, know our own estate, how able such a work to undergo, to weigh against his opposite, or else we fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of a house beyond his power to build it, who, half through, gives o'er, and leaves his part created cost a naked subject to the weeping clouds and waste for churlish winter's tyranny. Grant that our hopes, yet likely of fair birth, should be still born, and that we now possess the utmost man of expectation, I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What is the king but five and twenty thousand? To us no more, nay, not so much, Lord Bardolph, for his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads, one power against the French, and one against Glendower, perforce a third must take up us, so is the unfirm king, in three divided, and his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. That he should draw his several strengths together, and come against us in full puissance, need not be dreaded. If he should do so, he leaves his back unarmed, the French and Welsh baying him at the heels. Never fear that. Who is it like should lead his forces hither? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland, against the Welsh himself, and Harry Monmouth. But who is substituted against the French, I have no certain notice. Let us on, and publish the occasion of our arms. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. Their over-greedy love hath surfeited and habitation, giddy and unsure, hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. O thou, fond many, with what loud applause didst thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbroke, before he was what thou wouldst have him be? And being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder, art so full of him, that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so, thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard, and now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up, and howlst to find it. Who, what trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die, are now become enamoured on his grave. Thou that threwest dust upon his goodly head, when through proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of Bolingbroke, criest now, O earth, yield us that king again, and take thou this. O oh, thoughts of men accursed, past and to come seems best, things present worst. Shall we go draw our numbers and set on? 
We are time subjects, and time bids be gone. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two. Scene One. London, a street. Enter hostess with two officers, Fang and Snare. Master Fang, have you entered the action? It is entered. Where's your yeoman? Is the lusty yeoman? Will I stand to it? Sirrah, where's Snare? Oh, Lord, I, good master Snare. Here, here. Snare, we must arrest Sir John Falstaff. Yea, good master Snare, I have entered him and all. It may chance cost some of our lives, for he will stab. Alas, the day, take heed of him. He stabbed me in mine own house, and that most beastly. In good faith, it cares not what mischief he does, if his weapon be out. He will foin like any devil. He will spare neither man, woman, nor child. If I can close with him, I care not for his thrust. No, nor I neither. I'll be at your elbow. And I but fist him once, and I come but within my vice. I am undone by his going. I warrant you he's an infinitive thing upon my score. Good Master Fang, hold him sure. Good Master Snare, let him not scape. A comes continually to Pie Corner, saving your manhoods, to buy a saddle, and he is indicted to dinner to the lubber's head in Lumbert Street, to Master Smooth's the silkman. I pray you, since my exeon is entered, and my case so openly known to the world, let him be brought in to his answer. A hundred mark is a long one for a poor lone woman to bear, and I have borne and borne and borne, and have been fubbed off and fubbed off and fubbed off from this day to that day, that it is a shame to be thought on. There is no honesty in such dealing, unless a woman should be made an ass and a beast to bear every knave's wrong. Enter Sir John Falstaff, Page, and Bardolph. Yonder he comes, and that errant malmsey nosed knave Bardolph with him. Do your offices, do your offices, Master Fang and Master Snare. Do me, do me, do me your offices. How now? Whose mare's dead? What's the matter? Sir John, I arrest you at the suit of Mistress Quickly. Away, violets! Draw, Bardolph! Cut me off the villain's head! Throw the quain in the channel! Throw me in the channel? I'll throw thee in the channel! Wilt thou? Wilt thou, thou bastardly rogue? Murder! Murder! Ah, thou honeysuckle villain, wilt thou kill God's officers and the kings? Ah, thou honey-seed rogue, thou art a honey-seed, a man-queller and a woman-queller. Keep them off, Bardolph. A rescue! A rescue! Good people, bring a rescue or two. Thou what, what thou? Thou what, what the? Do, do, thou rogue, do, thou hemp-seed. Away, you scullion, you rampalian, you fustelarian. I'll tickle your catastrophe. Enter the Lord Chief Justice and his men. What is the matter? Keep the peace here, who? Good my lord, be good to me, I beseech you, stand to me. How now, Sir John? What are you brawling here? Doth this become your place, your time and business? You should have been well on your way to Jock. Stand from him, fellow, wherefore hangst thou upon him? O oh, my most worshipful lord, and please your grace, I am a poor widow of Eastcheap, and he is arrested at my suit. For what sum? It is more than for some, my lord, it is for all, all I have. He hath eaten me out of house and home, he hath put all my substance into that fat belly of his. But I will have some of it out again, or I will ride thee a nights like a mare. I think I am as like to ride the mare, if I have any vantage of ground, to get up. How comes this, Sir John? Fie, what man of good temper would endure this tempest of exclamation? Are you not ashamed to enforce a poor widow to so rough a course to come by her own? What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Mary, if thou wert an honest man, thyself and the money too. Thou didst swear to me upon a parcel-gilt goblet sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea-coal fire upon Wednesday and Weeson week when the prince broke thy head for liking his father to singing man of Windsor. Thou didst swear to me then, as I was washing thy wound, to marry me and make me my lady thy wife. Canst thou deny it? Did not good wife Keech, the butcher's wife, come in then and call me gossip quickly, coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar, telling us she had a good dish of prawns, whereby thou didst desire to eat some, whereby I told thee they were ill for green wound? And didst thou not, when she was gone downstairs, desire me to be no more so familiarity with such poor people, saying that ere long they should call me madam? And didst thou not kiss me, and bid me fetch the thirty shillings? I put thee now to thy book oath. Deny it, if thou canst. My lord, this is a poor mad soul, and she says up and down the town 
that her eldest son is like you. <laughs> she hath been in good case, and the truth is, poverty hath distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I beseech you I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I am well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cough the false way. It is not a confident brow, nor the throng of words that come with such more than impudent sauciness from you can thrust me from a level consideration. You have, as it appears to me, practised upon the easy dealing spirit of this woman, and made her serve your uses both in purse and in person. Yea, in truth, my lord. Pray thee peace. Pay her the debt you owe her, and unpay the villainy you have done with her, the one you may do with sterling money, and the other with current repentance. My lord, I will not undergo this sneep without reply. You call honourable boldness impudent sauciness. If a man will make curtsy and say nothing, he is virtuous. <laughs> no, my lord, my humble duty remembered. I will not be your suitor. I say to you, I do desire deliverance from these officers, being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. You speak as having power to do wrong, but answer in the effect of your reputation, and satisfy the poor woman. Come hither, hostess. Enter Gower. Now, Master Gower, what news? The king, my lord, and Harry, prince of Wales, are near at hand. The rest, the paper tells. Gives a letter. As I am a gentleman. Faith, you said so before. As I am a gentleman. Come. No more words of it. By this heavenly ground I trod on, I must be fain to pawn both my plate and the tapestry of my dining chambers. Glasses, glasses, is the only drinking. And for thy walls... A pretty slight drollery, or the story of the prodigal, or the German hunting in waterwork is worth a thousand of these bed-hangers and these fly-bitten tapestries. Let it be ten pound, if thou canst. Come, and twere not for thy humours, there's not a better wench in England. Go, wash thy face, and draw the action. Come, thou must not be in this humour with me, and dost not know me. Come, come, I know thou wast set on to this. Pray thee, Sir John, let it be but twenty nobles, if faith I am loath to pawn my plate, so God save me, la. Let it alone. I'll make other shift. You'll be a fool still. Well, you shall have it, though I pawn my gown. I hope you'll come to supper. You'll pay me altogether? Will I live? To Bardolph. Go, with her, with her. Hook on, hook on. Will you have Doll Tearsheet meet you at supper? No more words. Let's have her. Exeunt hostess, Bardolph, and officers. I have heard better news. What's the news, my lord? Where lay the king to-night? At Basingstoke, my lord. I hope, my lord, all's well. What is the news, my lord? Come all his forces back? No. Fifteen hundred foot, five hundred horse, are marched up to my lord of Lancaster, against Northumberland and the archbishop. Comes the king back from Wales, my noble lord? You shall have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, good Master Gower. My lord! What's the matter? Uh, Master Gower, shall I entreat you with me to dinner? I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long, being you are to take soldiers up in the countess as you go. Will you sup with me, Master Gower? What foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? Master Gower, if they become me not, he was a fool that taught them me. This is the right fencing grace, my lord, tap for tap, and uh, so part fair. Now the lord lighten thee, thou art a great fool. Exit. Scene two. London. Another street. Enter Prince Henry and Poins. Before God, I am exceeding weary. Is it come to that? I had thought weariness durst not have attached one of so high blood. Faith it does me. 
though it discolors the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. The like, then. My appetite was not princely got. For by my troth I do now remember the poor creature, small beer. But indeed these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. What a disgrace it is to me to remember thy name, or to know thy face to-morrow, or to take note how many pair of silk stockings thou hast, these, these, and those that were thy peach-colored ones, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and another for use but that the tennis court keeper knows better than I. For it is a low ebb of linen with thee when thou keepest not racket there, as thou hast not done a great while, because the rest of thy low countries have made a shift to eat up thy Holland, and God knows whether those that ball out of the ruins of thy linen shall inherit his kingdom. But the midwives say the children are not in the fault, whereupon the world increases and kindreds are mightily strengthened. How ill it follows, after you have labored so hard, you should talk so idly. Tell me, how many good young princes would do so, their fathers being so sick as yours, at this time is? Shall I tell thee one thing, points? Yes, faith, and let it be an excellent good thing. It shall serve among wits of no higher breeding than thine. Go to, I stand the push of your one thing that you will tell. Mary, I tell thee, it is not meet that I should be sad, now my father is sick. Albeit, I could tell to thee, as to one it pleases me, for fault of a better to call my friend, I could be sad, and sad indeed, too. Very hardly upon such a subject. By this hand, thou thinkest me as far in the devil's book as thou, and Falstaff for obduracy and persistency. Let the end try the men. But I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick, and keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. The reason? What wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? I would think thee a most princely hypocrite. It would be every man's thought, and thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Never a man's thought in the world keeps the roadway better than thine. Every man would think me an hypocrite indeed. And what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Why, because you have been so lewd and so much engraft to Falstaff. And to thee. By this light I am well spoke on. I can hear it with mine own ears. The worst that they can say of me is that I am a second brother, and that I am a proper fellow of my hands. And those two things, I confess, I cannot help. By the mass, here comes Bardolph. Enter Bardolph and Page. And the boy that I gave Falstaff. I had him from me, Christian. And look, if the fat villain have not to transform in him ape. God save your grace. And yours, most noble Bardolph. Come, you virtuous ass, you bashful fool, must you be blushing? Wherefore blush you now? What a maidenly man at arms are you become? Is it such a matter to get a pottle pot's maidenhead? I calls me e'en now, my lord, through a red lattice, and I could discern no part of his face from the window. At last I spied his eyes, and methought he had made two holes in the alewife's new petticoat, and so peeped through. Has not the boy profited away you worse an upright rabbit away away you rascally althea's dream away instruct us boy what dream boy marry my lord althea dreamt she was delivered of a firebrand and therefore i call him her dream a crown's worth of good interpretation there tis boy oh that this blossom could be kept from cankers well there's sixpence to preserve thee and you do not make him be hanged among you the gallows shall have wrong and how doth thy master, Bodolph? Well, my lord, he heard of your graces coming to town. Here's a letter for you. 
delivered with good respect. And how doth the mortal mass, your master? In bodily health, sir. Mary, the immortal part needs a physician, but that moves not him. Though that be sick, it dies not. I do allow this well to be as familiar with me as my dog. And he holds his place, for, look you, how he writes. Reads. John Falstaff, Knight. Every man must know that as oft as he has occasion to name himself, even like those that are kin to the king, for they never prick their finger, but they say, There's some of the king's blood spilt. How comes that? Says he, that takes upon him not to conceive. The answer is as ready as a borrower's cap. I am the king's poor cousin, sir. Nay, they will be kin to us, or they will fetch it from Yafet. But the letter. Reads. Sir John Falstaff, knight, to the son of the king nearest his father, Harry, Prince of Wales, greeting. Why, this is a certificate. Peace. Reads. I will imitate the honorable Romans in brevity. He sure means brevity and breath, short-winded. Reads. <clears throat> I commend me to thee, I commend thee, and I leave thee. Be not too familiar with points, for he misuses thy favors so much that he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. Repent at idle times as thou mayst, and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much to say as thou usest him, Jack Falstaff with my familiars, John with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John with all Europe. My lord, I'll steep this letter in sack, and make him eat it. That's to make him eat twenty of his words. But do you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? God send the wench no worse fortune. But I never said so. Well, thus we play the fools with the time, and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London? Yea, my lord. Where sups he? Doth the old boar feed in the old frank? At the old place, my lord, in Eastcheap. What company? Ephesians, my lord, of the old church. Sup any women with him? None, my lord, but old Mistress Quickly and Mistress Dull Tearsheet. What pagan may that be? A proper gentlewoman, sir, and a kinswoman of my master's. Even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. Shall we sail upon them, Ned, at supper? I am your shadow, my lord. I'll follow you. Sirrah, you boy, and Bardolph. No word to your master that I am yet come to town. There's for your silence. I have no tongue, sir. And for mine, sir, I will govern it. Fare you well. Go. Exit Bardolph and Page. This dull tear sheet should be some road. I warrant you, as common as the way between St. Albans and London. <laughs> How might we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colors, and not ourselves be seen? Put on two leathern jerkins and aprons, and wait upon him at his table as drawers. From a god to a bull, a heavy dissension. It was Jove's case. From a prince to a prentice, a low transformation. That shall be mine, for in everything the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Ned. Exit. Scene three. Warkworth, before the castle. Enter Northumberland, Lady Northumberland, and Lady Percy. I pray thee, loving wife and gentle daughter, Give even way unto my rough affairs. Put not you on the visage of the times, and be, like them, to Percy troublesome. I have given over, I will speak no more. Do what you will, your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honour is at pawn, and but my going nothing can redeem it. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars! The time was father when you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now when your own percy when my heart dear harry through many a northward looked to see his father bring up his powers but he did long in vain who then persuaded you to stay at home 
there were two honours lost, yours and your son's. For yours the God of heaven brightened it. For his it stuck upon him like the sun in the grey vault of heaven, and by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was, indeed, the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. He had no legs that practised not his gait, and speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, became the accents of the valiant, for those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humours of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, oh wondrous him, O oh, miracle of men, him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hopspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. Never, oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. And my sweet Harry had but half their numbers. Today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Beshrew your heart, fair daughter, you do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. But I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. Oh, fly to Scotland, till that the nobles and the armed commons have of their puissance made a little taste. If they get ground and vantage of the king, then join you with them like a rib of steel to make strength stronger. But for all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son. He was so suffered. So came I a widow. And never shall have length of life enough to rain upon remembrance with mine eyes, that it may grow and sprout as high as heaven for recordation to my noble husband. Come, come, go in with me, tis with my mind, as with the tide swelled up into his height, that makes a still stand running neither way. Fain would I go to meet the archbishop, but many thousand reasons hold me back. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I, till time and vantage crave my company. Exeunt. Scene 4. London, the Boar's Head Tavern in East Chew. Enter Francis and another drawer. What the devil hast thou brought there? Applejohns? Thou knowest Sir John cannot endure an Applejohn. Mass, thou sayest true. The prince once set a dish of apple johns before him, and told him there were five more Sir Johns, and, putting off his hat, said, I will now take my leave of these six dry, round, old, withered knights. It angered him to the heart, but he hath forgot that. Why, then, cover and set them down, and see if thou canst find out Sneak's noise. Mistress Tearsheet would fain hear some music. Enter third drawer. Dispatch. The room where they supped is too hot. They'll come in straight. Sirrah, here will be the prince and master poins anon, and they will put on two of our jerkins and aprons, and Sir John must not know of it. Bardolph hath brought word. By the mass, here will be old arts. It will be an excellent stratagem. I'll see if I can find out sneak. Exeunt second and third drawers. Enter hostess and doll tear sheet. If faith, sweetheart, methinks you are in excellent good temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinarily as heart would desire, and your color, I warrant you, is as red as any rose, in good truth, la. But if faith, you have drunk too much canaries, and that's a marvelous searching wine, and it perfumes the blood ere one can say, what's this? How do you now? Better than I was. <clears throat> well, that's well said. A good heart's worth gold. Lo, here comes Sir John. Enter Falstaff. Who when Arthur first in court? <laughs> Empty the Jordan. Exit Francis. And was a worthy king. How now, Mistress Doll? Sick of a calm, yea, in good faith. And 
so is all her sacked and they be once in a calm they are sick a pox damn you you muzzy rascal is that all the comfort you give me you make fat rascals mistress doll i make em gluttony and diseases make them i make em not if the cook help to make the gluttony you help to make the diseases doll we catch of you doll we catch of you <laughs> grant that my poor virtue grant that yea joy our chains and our jewels your brooches pearls and ouches <laughs> for to serve bravely is to come halting off you know to come off the breach with his pike bent bravely and to surgery bravely to venture upon the charged chambers bravely hang yourself you muddy conger hang yourself by my troth this is the old fashion you two never meet but you fall to some discord you are both the good truth as rheumatic as two dry toasts you cannot bear with another's confirmities what the good year one must bear and that must be you you are the weaker vessel as they say the emptier vessel can a weak empty vessel bear such a huge full hogshead there's old merchant's venture of bordeaux stuff in him you've not seen a hulk better stuffed than the old come i'll be friends with thee jack thou art going to the wars and whether i shall ever see thee again or no there is nobody cares re-enter francis sir ancient pistols below and would speak with you hang him swaggering rascal let him not come either it's a foul-mouthed rogue in england if he swagger let him not come here no by my faith i must live among my neighbours i'll know swaggerers i am in good name and fame with the very best shut the door there comes no swaggerers here i have not lived all this while to have swaggering now shut the door i pray you dost thou hear hostess pray ye pacify yourself sir john there comes no swaggerers here dost thou hear it is mine ancient tilly fally sir john ne'er tell me and your ancient swaggerer comes not in my doors i was before master tisick the deputy the other day and as he said to me twas no longer ago than wednesday last a good faith neighbour quickly says he master dumby our minister was by then neighbour quickly says he receive those that are civil for said he you are in an ill name now i said so i can tell whereupon for says he you are an honest woman and well thought on therefore take heed what guests you receive receive says he no swaggering companions there comes none here you would bless you to hear what he said no i'll no swaggerers he's no swaggerer hostess a tame cheater a faith you may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound you'll not swagger with a barbary hen if her feathers turn back in any show of resistance call him up drawer exit francis cheater call you him i will bar no honest man my house nor no cheater but i do not love swaggering by my troth i am the worse when one says swagger feel masters how i shake look you i warrant you so you do hostess do i yea in very truth do i and twere an aspen leaf i cannot abide swaggerers enter pistol bardolph and page god save you sir john welcome ancient pistol here pistol i charge you with a cup of sack do you discharge upon mine hostess i will discharge upon her sir john with two bullets oh is she his pistol proof sir you shall not hardly offend her come i'll drink no proofs nor no bullets i'll drink no more than will do me good for no man's pleasure i then to you mistress dorothy i will charge you charge me i scorn you scurvy companion what you poor base rascally cheating lack linen mate away you mouldy rogue away i am meet for your master i know you mistress dorothy away you cut-purse rascal you filthy bung away by this wine i'll thrust my knife in your mouldy chaps and you play the saucy cuttle with me away you bottle-ale rascal you basket-hilt stale juggler you since when i pray you sir god's light with two points on your shoulder much god let me not live but i will murder your ruff for this no more pistol i would not have you go off here discharge yourself of our company pistol no good captain pistol not here sweet captain captain thou abominable damned cheater art thou not ashamed to be called captain and captains were of my mind they've trunching you out for taking their names upon you before you've earned em 
You a captain. You slave for what? For tearing a poor oars rough in a boardy house? He a captain, hang him, rogue. He lives upon mouldy stewed prunes and dried cakes. A captain. God's light, these villains will make the word as odious as the word occupy, which was an excellent good word before it was ill-sorted. Therefore captains had need look to it. Pray thee go down, good ancient. Hark thee hither, Mistress Doll. Not I. I tell thee what, Corporal Bardolph, I could tear her. I'll be revenged of her. Pray thee go down. I'll see her damned first to Pluto's damned lake, by this hand to the infernal deep with Erebus and torches, vials also. Hold hook and line, say I, down, down, dogs, down, faters. Have we not hire in here? Good Captain Pease will be quiet, tis very late of faith. I beseech you now, aggravate your collar. These be good humours indeed, shall pack horses and hollow pampered jades of Asia, which cannot go but thirty mile a day, compare with Caesars, and with cannibals and Trojan Greeks. Nay, rather damn them with King Cerberus, and let the Rulkin roar! Shall we fall foul for toys? By my troth, Captain, these are very bitter words. Be gone, good ancient. This will grow into a brawl anon. Die, men like dogs! Give crowns like pins! Have we not iron here? My word, Captain, there's none such here. What the good year, do you think I would deny her? For God's sake, be quiet. Then feed and be fat, my fair Callipolis. Come, give us some sack. Si fortuna mi tormenta, sperato mi contento. Fear we broadsides? No. Let the fiend give fire. Give me some sack, and sweetheart, lie thou there. Laying down his sword. Come we to full points here, and are et cetera's nothings? Pistol, I would be quiet. Sweet knight, I kiss thine eaf. What? We have seen the seven stars. For God's sake, thrust him down the stairs. I cannot endure such a fustian rascal. Thrust him downstairs. No, we not Galloway nags. Quite him down, Bardolph, like a shove-groat shilling. Nay, and it do nothing but speak nothing. It shall be nothing here. Come, get you downstairs. What? Shall we have incision? Shall we embrew? Snatching up his sword. Then death rock me asleep. Abridge my doleful days. Why then let grievous ghastly gaping wounds untwine the sisters three. Come, Atropos, I say. Here's goodly stuff toward. Give me my rapier, boy. I pray thee, Jack, I pray thee, do not draw. Get you downstairs. Drawing and driving pistol out. Here's a goodly tumult. I'll forswear keeping house afore I'll be in these turrets and frights. So murder, I warned now. Alas, alas, put up your naked weapons. Put up your naked weapons. Exit Pistol and Bardolf. I pray thee, Jack, be quiet. The rascal's gone. Oh, you wholesome little valiant villain, you. Are you not hurt in the groin? Methought it made a shrewd thrust at your belly. Re-enter Bardolf. Have you turned him out of doors? Yea, sir, the rascal's drunk. You have hurt him, sir, in the shoulder. A rascal? To brave me? Ah, oh, you sweet rogue, you! Alas, poor ape, how thou sweetest! Come, let me wipe thy face. Come on, you horse and chops! Ah, oh, rogue! If <laughs> faith I love thee, thou art as valorous as Hector of Troy, worth five of Agamemnon, and ten times better than the nine worthies. Ah, oh, villain! A rascally slave! I will toss the rogue in a blanket! Do, and thou darest for thy heart. And thou dost, I'll canvas thee between a pair of sheets. Enter musicians. The music is calm, sir. Let them play. Play, sirs. Sit on my knee, doll. A rascal bragging slave. The rogue fled from me like quicksilver. If faith, and thou followest him like a church. Thou wholesome little tidy bar folly me boar pig, when will thou leave fighting a days and foining a nights, and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? Enter behind Prince Henry and Poins disguised as drawers. Peace, good doll. Do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. Cyril, what humour's the prince of? A good shallow young fellow. He would have made a good pantler. He would have chipped bread well. They say Poins has a good wit. 
he a good wit hang him baboon his wits as thick as tewksbury mustard there's no more conceit in him than is in a mallet why does the prince love him so then because their legs are both of a bigness and they plays at quite well and eats conger and fennel and drinks off candles ends for flap dragons and rides the wild mare with the boys and jumps upon joined stools and swears with a good grace and wears his boots very smooth like unto the sign of the leg and breeds no bait with telling of discreet stories and such other gamble faculties a has that show a weak mind in an able body for the which the prince admits him for the prince himself is such another <laughs> a weight of a hair will turn the scales between their avid the poise would not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off let's beat him before his whore look where the withered elder hath on his pole clawed like a parrot is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance kiss me doll saturn and venus this year in conjunction what says the almanac to that and look whether the fiery trigon his man be not lisping to his master's old tables his notebook his council keeper Ooh, thou dost give me flattering buses by my troth i kiss thee with a most constant heart i am old i am old i love thee better than i love e'er a scurvy young boy of em all what stuff wilt have a kirtle of i shall receive money a thursday shalt have a cap to-morrow a merry song come a grows late will to bed thou'lt forget me when i am gone by my truth thou'd set me a-weeping and thou saidst so prove that ever i dress myself handsome till thy return well hearken at the end some sack francis anon anon, 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 anon sir. sir advancing ha a bastard son of the king's and art thou not poins his brother why thou globe of sinful continence what a life dost thou lead a better than thou i am a gentleman thou art a drawer very true sir and i come to draw you out by the ears Oh, the Lord preserve thy grace. By my troth, welcome to London. Now the Lord bless that sweet face of thine. Oh, Jesu, are you come from Wales? Thou horse and mad compound of majesty. By this light flesh and corrupt blood, thou art welcome. How, oh, you fat fool, I scorn you. My Lord, he will drive you out of your revenge and turn all to a merriment, if you take not the heat. You, horse and camel mine, you... How vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentlewoman? God's blessing are your good heart, and so she is, by my troth. Didst thou hear me? Yea, and you knew me as you did when you ran away by Gad's Hill. You knew I was at your back, and spoke it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 not so. I did not think thou wast within hearing. I shall drive you, then, to confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No abuse, Hal. Oh, my honor, no abuse. Not to dispraise me, and calmly pander, and bread-chipper, and I know not what. No abuse, Hal. No abuse. No abuse, Ned. In the world, honest Ned, none. I, I dispraised him before the wicked that the wicked might not fall in love with thee in which doing i have done the part of a careful friend and a true subject and thy father is to give me thanks for it no abuse hal none ned none no faith boys none see now whether pure fear and entire cowardice doth not make me wrong this virtuous gentleman to close with us? Is she of the wicked? Is thine hostess here of the wicked? Or is thy boy of the wicked? Or honest Bardolph, whose zeal burns in his nose of the wicked? Answer, thou dead elm, answer. The fiend hath pricked down Bardolph irrecoverable, and his face is Lucifer's privy kitchen. 
where he doth nothing but roast malt worms. For the boy, there is a good angel about him, but the devil outbids him too. For the women? For one of them. She's in hell already, and burns poor souls. For the other, I owe her money, and whether she be damned for that I know not. No, I warrant you. No, I think thou art not. I think thou art quit for that. Mary, there is another indictment upon thee for suffering flesh to be eaten in thy house, contrary to the law, for the which I think thou wilt howl. All victuallers do so. What's a joint of mutton or two in a whole Lent? You, gentlewoman. What says your grace? His grace says that which his flesh rebels against. Knocking within. Who knocks so loud at door? Look to the door there, Francis. Enter Peto. Peto, how now? What news? The king your father is at Westminster, and there are twenty weak and wearied posts come from the north. And as I came along I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns and asking every one for Sir John Falstaff. By heaven, Poins, I feel me much to blame. So idly to profane the precious time, and tempest of commotion like the south, born with black vapour, that begin to melt and drop upon our bare unarmed heads. Give me my sword and cloak. Falstaff, good night. Exeunt Prince, Poins, Peto, and Bardolph. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night, and we must hence, and leave it unpicked. Knocking within. More knocking at the door. Re-enter Bardolph. How now? What's the matter? You must away to court, sir, presently. A dozen captains stay at door for you. To the page. Pay the musicians, sir. Farewell, hostess. <laughs> Farewell, doll. You see, my good wenches, how men of merit are sought after. <laughs> the undeserver may sleep when a man of action is called on. Farewell, good wenches. If I be not sent away post, I will see you again ere I go. I cannot speak. If my heart be not ready to burst, well, sweet Jack, have a care of thyself. Farewell! Farewell! Exeunt Falstaff and Bardolph. Well, fare thee well. I have known thee these twenty-nine years come peace God time, but an honester and truer-hearted man, well, fare thee well. Within. Mistress Tearsheet! What's the matter? Within. Bid Mistress Tearsheet come to my master. Oh, run, doll, run, run, good, come. To Bardolph. She comes, blubbered. Yea, will you come, doll? Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three. Scene One. Westminster, the palace. Enter the king in his nightgown with a page. Go call the earls of Surrey and of Warwick. But ere they come, bid them o'er read these letters, and well consider of them. Make good speed. Exit Page. How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? O oh, sleep, O oh, gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse, how have I frighted thee, that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down, and steep my senses in forgetfulness? Why, rather, sleep, liest thou in smoky cribs, upon uneasy pallets, stretching thee, and hushed with buzzing night-flies to thy slumber, than in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sound of sweetest melody. O thou dull god! Why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds, and leavest the kingly couch a watch-case, or a common lorum bell Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship-boy's eyes, and rock his brains in cradle of the rude imperious surge, and in the visitation of the winds, who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads, and hanging them with deafening clamour in the slippery clouds, that with the hurly death itself awakes? Canst thou, O partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea-boy in an hour so rude, and in the calmest and most stillest night? with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king? Then happy, lo, lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Enter Warwick and Surrey. 
Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, lords? Tis one o'clock and past. Why then, good morrow to you all, my lords. Have you read o'er the letters that I sent you? We have, my liege. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. It is but as a body yet distempered, which to his former strength may be restored, with good advice and little medicine. My lord Northumberland will soon be cooled. O oh God, that one might read the book of fate, and see the revolution of the times make mountains level, and the continent, weary of solid firmness, melt itself into the sea, and other times to see the beachy girdle of the ocean, too wide for Neptune's hips, how chances mock, and changes fill the cup of alteration with divers liquors. Oh, if this were seen, the happiest youth, viewing his progress through, what perils past, what crosses to ensue, would shut the book, and sit him down and die. Tis not ten years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together, and in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years since this Percy was the man nearest my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs, and laid his love and life under my foot. Yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard gave him defiance. But which of you was by? To Warwick. You, cousin Neville, as I may remember, when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and rated by Northumberland, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy? Northumberland, thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. Though then, God knows, I had no such intent, but that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. The time shall come, thus did he follow it the time will come that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption so went on foretelling the same time's condition and the division of our amity there is a history in all men's lives figuring the natures of the times deceased the which observed a man may prophesy with a near aim of the main chance of things as yet not come to life who in their seeds and weak beginning lie entreasured. Such things become the hatch and brood of time, and by the necessary form of this King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland then false to him would of that seed grow to a greater falseness which should not find a ground to root upon unless on you. Are these things, then, necessities? Then let us meet them like necessities. And that same word even now cries out on us. They say the bishop and Northumberland are fifty thousand strong. It cannot be, my lord. Rumour doth double like the voice and echo, the numbers of the feared. Please it, your grace, to go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. To comfort you the more I have received a certain instance that Glendower is dead. Your majesty hath been this fortnight ill, and these unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I will take your counsel. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the Holy Land. Exeunt. Scene two. Gloucestershire, before Justice Shallow's house. Enter Shallow and Silence, meeting. Mouldy, Shadow, Wart, Feeble, Bullcalf, and Servants behind. Come on, come on, come on! Give me your hand, sir, give me your hand, sir! An early stir by the rude, and how doth my good cousin silence? Good morrow, good cousin Shallow. And how doth my cousin, your bedfellow, and your fairest daughter and mine, my goddaughter, Ellen? Alas, a black oozle, cousin Shallow. By yea and no, sir, I dare say my cousin William is become a good scholar. 
he is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, sir, to my cost. He must then to the inns are caught shortly. I was once of Clement's Inn, where I think they will talk of mad shallow yet. You were called lusty shallow then, cousin. By the mass, I was called anything, and I would have done anything indeed, too, and roundly too. There was I, and little John Doit of Staffordshire, and black John Barnes, and Francis Pickbone, and Will Squeal, a Cotswold man. You had not four such swinge bucklers in all the inns of court again. <laughs> and I may say to you, we knew where the bona robbers were, and had the best of them all at commandment. Then was Jack Falstaff, now Sir John, boy and page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. This Sir John, cousin, that comes hither anon about soldiers? The same Sir John, the very same. I see him break Scoggins' head at the court gate when he was a crack not thus high. And the very same day did I fight with one Samson Stockfish, a fruiterer, behind Gray's Inn. <laughs> Jesu, Jesu, the mad days that I have spent. And to see how many of my old acquaintance are dead. We shall all follow, cousin. Certain? Tis certain. Sure, very sure. Death, as the psalmist saith, is certain to all. All shall die. How a good yoke of bullocks at Stamford Fair? By my troth, I was not there. Death is certain. Is old double of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Jesu, Jesu. Dead. Drew a good bow, and dead. He shot a fine shoot. John Gaunt loved him well, and betted much money on his head. Dead. He would have clapped to the clout at twelve score, and carried you a forehand shot of fourteen and fourteen and a half. That would have done a man's heart good to see. How a score of yous now? Thereafter, as they be, a score of good ewes may be worth ten pounds. And his old double dead. Enter Bardolph, and one with him. Here come two of Sir John Falstaff's men, as I think. Good morrow, honest gentlemen. I beseech you, which is just as shallow? I am Robert Shallow, sir, a poor esquire of this county, and one of the King's Justices of the Peace. What is your good pleasure with me? My captain, sir, commends him to you, my captain, Sir John Falstaff, a tall gentleman by heaven, and a most gallant leader. He greets me well, sir. I knew him, a good backsword man. How doth the good knight? May I ask how my lady, his wife, doth? Sir, pardon, a soldier is better accommodated than with a wife. It is well said in faith, sir. And it is well said indeed, too. Better accommodated. It is good. Yea, indeed, is it. Good phrases are surely and ever were very commendable. Accommodated. It comes of accommodo. Very good. A good phrase. Pardon, sir. I have heard the word. Phrase, you call it? By this day I know not the phrase, but I will maintain the word with my sword to be a soldier-like word, and a word of exceeding good command by heaven. Accommodated, that is, when a man is, as they say, accommodated, or when a man is being, whereby a may be thought to be accommodated, which is an excellent thing. Enter Falstaff. It is very just. Look, here comes good Sir John. Give me your good hand, give me your worship's good hand. By my troth, you like well, and bear your years very well. Welcome, good Sir John. I am glad to see you well, good Master Robert Shallow. 
"'Master Surecard, as I think?' "'No, Sir John, it is my cousin, Silence, in commission with me.' "'Good Master Silence, it well befits you should be of the peace.' "'Your good worship is welcome.' "'Fie, this is hot weather. Gentlemen, have you provided me here half a dozen sufficient men?' "'Marry, have we, sir. Will you sit?' "'Let me see them, I beseech you.' "'Where's the roll? Where's the roll? Where's the roll? Let, let, let me see, let me see, let me see. So, 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 yea, marry, sir. Rafe Mouldy, uh, let them appear as I call. Let them do so, let them do so. Let me see. Where is Mouldy? "'Here, and please you.' "'What think you, Sir John? A good-limbed fellow, young, strong, and of good friends?' "'Is thy name Mouldy?' Yea, an it please you. Tis the more time thou wert used. Ha, <laughs> ha, ha! Most excellent, i' faith. Things that are mouldy lack use. Very singular good, in faith. Well said, Sir John, very well said. Prick him. I was pricked well enough before, and you could have let me alone. My old dame will be undone now, for one to do her husbandry and her drudgery. You need not have pricked me. There are other men fitter to go out than I. Go to. Peace, Mouldy. You shall go. Mouldy, it is time you were spent. Spent? Peace, fellow, peace. S stand aside. Know you where you are? For the other. Sir John, uh, let me see. Uh, Simon Shadow. <laughs> Yea, Mary, let me have him to sit under. He's like to be a cold soldier. Where's Shadow? Yes, yeah, sir. Shadow, whose son art thou? My mother's son, sir. Thy mother's son, like enough, and thy father's shadow. So the son of the female is the shadow of the male. It is often so, indeed, but much of the father's substance. Do you like him, Sir John? Shadow will serve for summer. Prick him, for we have a number of shadows fill up the muster brook. Thomas, Wart. Where's he? Here, sir. Is thy name Wart? Yes, sir. Thou art a very ragged Wart. Shall I prick him, Sir John? It were superfluous, for his apparel is built upon his back, and the whole frame stands upon pins. Prick him no more. Ha, 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 You can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. Francis Feeble. Here, sir. What trade art thou, Feeble? A woman's tailor, sir. Shall I prick him, sir? You may, but if he had been a man's tailor, he'd have pricked you. <laughs> Wilt thou make as many holes in an enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? I will do my good will, sir. You can have no more. Well said, good woman's tailor, well said, courageous feeble. Thou wilt be as valiant as the wrathful dove, or most magnanimous mouse. Prick the woman's tailor. Well, Master Shallow, deep, Master Shallow. I would what might have gone, sir. I would thou wert a man's tailor, that thou mightst mend him, and make him fit to go. I cannot put him to a private soldier. That is the leader of so many thousands. Let that suffice, most forcible feeble. It shall suffice, sir. I am bound to thee, reverend feeble, who is next. Peter Bullcalf of the Green. Yea, Mary, let's see Bullcalf. He, sir. For God, a likely fellow. Come prick me Bullcalf till he roar again. O oh, Lord, good my Lord Captain. What? Dost thou roar before thou art pricked? O oh Lord, sir, I am a diseased man. What disease hast thou? A horse and cold, sir, a cough, sir, which I caught with ringing in the king's affairs upon his coronation day, sir. Come, thou shalt go to the wards in a gown. We will have away thy cold, and I will take such order that thy friends shall ring for thee. Is here all? Here is two more called than your number. You must have but four here, sir, and so I pray you go in with me to dinner. 
Come, I will go drink with you, but I cannot tarry dinner. I am glad to see you by my troth, Master Shallow. Oh, Sir John, do you remember, since we lay all night in the windmill in St. George's Field? No more of that, Master Shallow, no more of that. Ah, it was a merry night. And is Jane Nightwork alive? She lives, Master Shallow. She could never away with me. Never, never. She would always say she could not abide, Master Shallow. By the mass, I could anger her to the heart. She was then a bona roba. Does she hold her own well? Old, old, Master Shallow. Well, nay, she must be old. She cannot choose but be old. Certain she's old. And had Robin Nightwork by old Nightwork before I came to Clement's Inn. That's fifty-five year ago. <sighs> Cousin Silence, that thou had seen that that this night and I have seen. <laughs> Sir John, said I well? We have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. That we have. That we have. That we have. In faith, Sir John, we have. Our watchword was, Hem, boys! Come, let's to dinner. Come, let's to dinner, Jesus! The days that we have seen. Come, come. Exeunt Falstaff and the Justices. Good Master Corporate Bardolph, stand, my friend, and here's four hurry ten shillings in French crowns for you. In very truth, sir, I had as lief be hanged, sir, as go. And yet for mine own part, sir, I do not care, but rather because I am unwilling and, for mine own part, have a desire to stay with my friends. Else, sir, I did not care for mine own part so much. Go to, stand aside. And, good master corporal captain, for my old dame's sake, stand by friend. She has nobody to do anything about her when I am gone, and she is old, and cannot help herself. You shall have forty, sir. Go to, stand aside. By my troth I care not. A man can die but once. We owe God a death. I'll ne'er bear a base mind. And it be my destiny, so. And it be not, so. No man's too good to serve as prince, and, let it go which way it will, he that dies this year is quit for the next. Well said. Thou'rt a good fellow. Faith, I'll bear no base mind. Re-enter Falstaff and the Justices. Come, sir, which men shall I have? Four of which you please. Sir, a word with you. I have three pounds to free Mouldy and Bullcalf. Go to, well. Come, Sir John, which four will you have? Do you choose for me? Marry, then, Mouldy, Bullcalf, Feeble, and Shadow. Mouldy and Bullcalf. For you, Mouldy, stay at home till you are past service. And for your part, Bullcalf, grow you come unto it. I will none of you. Sir John, Sir John, do not yourself wrong. They are your likeliest men, and... I would have you served with the best. Will you tell me, Master Shallow, how to choose a man? Care I for the limb, the thews, the stature, bulk, and big assemblance of a man? Give me the spirit, Master Shallow. Here's what. You see what a ragged appearance it is? I shall charge you, and discharge you, with the motion of a pewterer's hammer. Come off and on, swifter than he that gibbets on the brewer's bucket. And this same half-faced fellow, Shadow, give me this man. He presents no mark to the enemy. The foeman may, with his great aim, level at the edge of a penknife. And for a retreat, how swiftly will this feeble, the woman's tailor, run off? Oh, give me the spare men, and spare me the great ones. Put me a caliver into Wart's hand, Bardolph. Hold, Wart. Traverse. Thus. 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 Come, manage me your caliver. 
so very well go to very good exceeding good oh give me always a little lean old chopped bald shot <laughs> well said a faith what thou'rt a good scab hold there's a tester for thee he is not his craft's master he doth not do it right i remember at mile end green when i lay at clement's inn i was then sir dagonet in arthur's show there was a little quiver fellow and he would manage you his piece thus and he would about and about and come you in and come you in ra ta ta he would say bounce he would say and away again would he go and again would he come <laughs> I shall ne'er see such a fellow. These fellows will do well. Master Shallow, God keep you. Master Silence, I will not use many words with you. Fare you well. Gentlemen, both, I thank you. I must a dozen mile to-night. Bardolph, give the soldiers coats. Sir John, the Lord bless you. God prosper your affairs. God set us peace. At your return, visit our house. Let our old acquaintance be renewed. Peradventure I will with you to the court. For God would you would. Go to. I have spoke at a word. God keep you. Fare you well, gentle gentlemen. Exeunt justices. On Bardolph, lead the men away. Exeunt all but Falstaff. As I return, I will fetch off these justices. I do see the bottom of justice shallow. Lord, Lord, how subject we old men are to this vice of lying! This same starved justice hath done nothing but prate to me of the wildness of his youth, and the feats he hath done about Turnbull Street. And every third word a lie. Doer paid to the hearer than the Turk's tribute. I do remember him at Clement's Inn, like a man made after supper of a cheese paring. When he was naked, he was for all the world like a forked radish, with a head fantastically carved upon it with a knife. He was so forlorn that his dimensions to any thick sight were invisible. He was the very genius of a famine, <laughs> yet lecherous as a monkey and the whores called him Mandrake. He came ever in the rearward of the fashion, and sung those tunes to the overscutched huswives that he heard the carmen whistle, and swear they were his fancies or his good nights. And now is this vice's dagger become a squire, and talks as familiarly of John Agaunt as if he had been sworn brother to him. "'And I'll be sworn I never saw him but once in the tilt-yard, "'and then he burst his head for crowding among the marshal's men. "'I saw it, and told John Agant he beat his own name, "'for you might have thrust him and all his apparel into an eel-skin. "'The case of a treble hot boy was a mansion for him, a court, "'and now has he land and beeves. "'Well, I'll be acquainted with him if I return, and it shall go hard, but I'll make him a philosopher's two stones to me. If the young dace be a bait for the old pike, I see no reason in the law of nature but I may snap at him. Let time shape, and there an end. Exit. End of Act Three. Act Four, Scene One. Yorkshire, within the forest of Galtry. Enter the Archbishop of York, Mowbray, Hastings, and others. What is this forest called? Tis Galtry Forest, and shall please your grace. Here stand, my lords, and send discoverers forth, to know the numbers of our enemies. We have sent forth already. Tis well done. My friends and brethren in these great affairs, I must acquaint you that I have received new dated letters from Northumberland. Their cold intent, tenor, and substance thus. Here doth he wish his person, with such powers as might hold sortance with his quality, the which he could not levy, whereupon he is retired to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland, and concludes in hearty prayers 
that your attempts may overlive the hazard and fearful melting of their opposite thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces enter a messenger now what news west of this forest scarcely off a mile in goodly form comes on the enemy and by the ground they hide i judge their number upon or near the rate of thirty thousand the just proportion that we gave them out let us sway on and face them in the field enter westmoreland what well-appointed leader fronts us here i think it is my lord of westmoreland health and fair greeting from our general the prince lord john and duke of lancaster say on my lord of westmoreland in peace what doth concern your coming then my lord unto your grace do i in chief address the substance of my speech if that rebellion came like itself in base and abject routs led on by bloody youth guarded with rags and countenanced by boys and beggary i say if damned commotion so appeared in his true native and most proper shape you reverend father and these noble lords had not been here to dress the ugly form of base and bloody insurrection with your fair honours you lord archbishop whose see is by a civil peace maintained whose beard the silver hand of peace hath touched whose learning and good letters peace hath tutored whose white investments figure innocence the dove and very blessed spirit of peace wherefore you do so ill translate yourself out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war turning your books to graves your ink to blood your pens to lances and your tongue divine to a loud trumpet and point of war wherefore do i this so the question stands briefly to this end we are all diseased and with our surfeiting and wanton hours have brought ourselves into a burning fever and we must bleed for it of which disease our late king richard being infected died but my most noble lord of westmoreland i take not on me here as a physician nor do i as an enemy to peace troop in the throngs of military men but rather show a while like fearful war to die at rank mind sick of happiness and purge the obstructions which begin to stop our very veins of life hear me more plainly i have in equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do what wrongs we suffer and find our griefs heavier than our offences we see which way the stream of time doth run and are enforced from our most quiet there by the rough torrent of occasion and have the summary of all our griefs when time shall serve to show in articles which long ere this we offered to the king and might by no suit gain our audience when we are wronged and would unfold our griefs we are denied access unto his person even by those men that most have done us wrong the dangers of the days but newly gone whose memory is written on the earth with yet appearing blood and the examples of every minute's instance present now have put us in these ill-beseeming arms not to break peace or any branch of it but to establish here a peace indeed concurring both in name and quality when ever yet was your appeal denied wherein have you been galled by the king what peer hath been suborned to grate on you that you should seal this lawless bloody book of forged rebellion with a seal divine and consecrate commotion's bitter edge my brother general the commonwealth to brother born and household cruelty i make my quarrel in particular there is no need of any such redress or if there were it not belongs to you why not to him in part and to us all that feel the bruises of the days before and suffer the condition of these times to lay a heavy and unequal hand upon our honours oh my good lord mowbray construe the times to their necessities and you shall say indeed it is the time and not the king that does you injuries yet for your part it not appears to me either from the king or in the present time that you should have an inch of any ground to build grief on 
were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk's signatories, your noble and right well-remembered fathers? What thing in honour had my father lost, that need to be revived and breathed in me? The king that loved him, as the state stood then, was force perforce compelled to banish him, and then that Henry Bolling broke and he, being mounted and both roused in their seats, their neighing causers daring of the spur, their armed staves in charge, their beavers down, their eyes of fire sparkling through sights of steel, and the loud trumpet blowing them together. Then, then, when there was nothing could have stayed, my father from the breast of bowling broke, oh, when the king did throw his warder down, his own life hung upon the staff he threw, then threw he down himself, and all their lives, that by indictment and by dint of sword, have since miscarried and a bowling broke. You speak, Lord Mowbray, now you know not what. The Earl of Hereford was reputed then in England the most valiant gentleman. Who knows on whom fortune would then have smiled? But if your father had been victor there, he near had borne it out of Coventry. For all the country in a general voice had cited hate upon him, and all their prayers and love were set on Hereford, whom they doted on, and blessed and graced indeed more than the king. But this is mere digression from my purpose. Here come I from our princely general to know your griefs, to tell you from his grace that he will give you audience, and wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them, everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. But he hath forced us to compel this offer, and it proceeds from policy, not love. Mowbray, you are ween to take it so. This offer comes from mercy, not from fear. For lo, with a ken our army lies, upon mine honour all too confident to give admittance to a thought of fear. Our battle is more full of names than yours, our men are more perfect in the use of arms, our armour all as strong, our cause the best. Then reason will our hearts should be as good. Say you not, then, our offer is compelled? Well, by my will we shall admit no parley. That argues but the shame of your offence. A rotten case abides no handling. Hath the Prince John a full commission, in very ample virtue of his father, to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? That is intended in the General's name. I muse you make so slight a question. Then take, my Lord of Westmoreland, this schedule, for this contains our general grievances. Each several article herein redressed, all members of our cause, both here and hence, that are insinued to this action, acquitted by a true substantial form and present execution of our wills, to us and to our purposes confined, we come within our lawful banks again, and knit our powers to the arm of peace. This will I show the general. Please you, lords, in sight of both our battles we may meet, and either end in peace which God so frame, or to the place of difference call the swords which must decide it. My lord, we will do so. Exit Westmoreland. There is a thing within my bosom tells me that no conditions of our peace can stand. Fear you not that, if we can make our peace upon such large terms, and so absolute as our conditions shall consist upon, our peace shall stand as firm as rocky mountains. Yea, but our valuation shall be such that every slight and false derived cause, yea, every idle, nice, and wanton reason, shall to the king taste of this action, that, were our royal faith smarters in love, we shall be winnowed with so rough a wind that even our corn shall seem as light as chaff, and good from bad find no partition. No, no, my lord, note this. The king is weary of dainty and such picking grievances, for he hath found, to end one doubt by death, revives two greater in the heirs of life, and therefore will he wipe his tables clean, and keep no tell-tale to his memory, that may repeat in history his loss to new remembrance. For full well he knows, he cannot so precisely weed this land as his misdoubts present occasion. His foes are so enrooted with his friends, that plucking to unfix an enemy, he doth unfasten so and shake a friend. So that this land, like an offensive wife, 
that hath enraged him on to offer strokes, as he is striking, holds his infant up, and hangs resolved correction in the arm that was upreared to execution. Besides, the king hath wasted all his rods on late offenders, that he now doth lack the very instruments of chastisement, so that his power, like to a fangless lion, may offer, but not hold. Tis very true. And therefore be assured, my good Lord Marshal, if we do now make our atonement well, our peace will, like a broken limb united, grow stronger for the breaking. Be it so. Here is returned my lord of Westmoreland. Re-enter Westmoreland. The prince is here at hand. Pleaseth your worship to meet his grace at just distance between our armies. Your grace of York, in God's name then set forward. Before, and greet his grace. My lord, we come. Exeunt. Scene two. Another part of the forest. Enter from one side, Mowbray, attended. Afterwards, the Archbishop, Hastings, and others from the other side. Prince John of Lancaster, Westmoreland, officers, and others. You are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle Lord Archbishop, and to you, Lord Hastings, and to all. My Lord of York, it better showed with you when that your flock assembled by the bell encircled you to hear with reverence your exposition of the holy text than now to see you here an iron man cheering a rout of rebels with your drum turning the word to sword and life to death that man that sits within the reach of a monarch's heart and ripens in the sunshine of his favour would he abuse the countenance of the king alack what mischiefs might he set a broach in shadow of such greatness with you lord bishop it is even so who have not heard it spoken how dupe you were within the books of god to us the speaker in his parliament to us the imagined voice of god himself the very opener and intelligencer between the grace the sanctities of heaven and our dull workings oh who shall believe but you misuse the reverence of your place employ the countenance and grace of heaven as a false favourite does his prince's name in deeds dishonourable you have ta'en up under the counterfeited zeal of god the subjects of his substitute my father and of both against the peace of heaven and him have here upswarmed them good my lord of lancaster i am not here against your father's peace but as i told my lord of westmoreland the time misorder doth in common sense crowd us and crush us to this monstrous form to hold our safety up i sent your grace the parcels and particulars of our grief the which hath been with scorn shoved from the court whereon this hydra son of war is born whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed asleep with grant of our most just and right desires and true obedience of this madness cured stoop tamely to the foot of majesty if not we ready are to try our fortunes to the last man and though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarry, theirs shall second them. And so success of mischief shall be born, and air from air shall hold this quarrel up, whilst England shall have generation. You are too shallow, Hastings, much too shallow, to sound the bottom of the after-times. Pleaseth your grace to answer them directly. How far forth do you like their articles? I like them all, and do allow well, and swear here by the honour of my blood my father's purposes have been mistook, and some about him have too lavishly wrested his meaning and authority. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed. Upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, discharge your powers unto their several counties, as we will ours, and here, between the armies, let us drink together friendly and embrace that all their eyes may bear these tokens home of our restored love and amity i take your princely word for these redresses i give it to you and will maintain my word and thereupon i drink unto your grace go captain and deliver to the army this news of peace let them have pay and part i know it will well please them hi thee captain exit officer to you, my noble lord of Westmoreland. 
I pledge your grace, and if you knew what pains I have bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. But my love to you shall show itself more openly hereafter. I do not doubt you. I am glad of it. Health to my lord and gentle cousin Mowbray. You wish me health in a very happy season, for I am on the sudden something ill. Against ill chances men are ever merry, but heaviness foreruns the good event. Therefore be merry, cos, since sudden sorrow serves to say thus, some good thing comes to-morrow. Believe me, I am passing light in spirit. So much the worse, if your own rule be true. Shouts within. The word of peace is rendered. Hark how they shout. This had been cheerful after victory. A peace is of the nature of a conquest, for then both parties nobly are subdued, and neither party loser. Go, my lord, and let our armies be discharged too. Exit Westmoreland. And, good my lord, so please you let our trains march by us that we may peruse the men we should have coped with all. Go, good lord Hastings, and ere they be dismissed, let them march by. Exit Hastings. I trust, lords, we shall lie to-night together. Re-enter Westmoreland. Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? The leaders, having charge from you to stand, will not go off until they hear you speak. They know their duties. Re-enter Hastings. My lord, our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked, they take their courses, east, west, north, south. Or, like a school broke up, each hurries toward his home and sporting place. Good tidings, my lord Hastings, for the which I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason. And you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Is this proceeding just and honourable? Is your assembly so? I pawn thee numb. I promised you redress of these same grievances, whereof you did complain, which by my honour I will perform with our most Christian care. But for you rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion, and such acts of yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered astray. God and not we have safely fought to-day. Some guard these traitors to the block of death, treason's true bed and yielder of breath. Exit. Scene 3. Another part of the forest. Alarum. Excursions. Enter Falstaff and Colville, meeting. What's your name, sir? Of what condition are you, and of what place, I pray? I am a knight, sir, and my name is Colville of the Dale. Well, then, Colville is your name, a knight is your degree, and your place the Dale. Colville shall still be your name, a traitor your degree, and a dungeon your place, a place deep enough. So shall you be still Colville of the Dale. And not you, Sir John Falstaff? As good a man is he, sir, whoe'er I am. Do you yield, sir, or shall I sweat for you? If I do sweat, they are the drops of thy lovers, and they weep for thy death. Therefore rouse up fear and trembling, and do observance to my mercy. I think you are, Sir John Falstaff, and in that thought yield me. I have a whole school of tongues in this belly of mine, and not a tongue of them all speaks any other word but my name. And I had but a belly of any indifferency, I were simply the most active fellow in Europe. My womb, my womb, my womb undoes me. Here comes our general. Enter Prince John of Lancaster, Westmoreland, Blunt, and others. The heat is past. Follow no further now. Call in the powers, good cousin Westmoreland. Exit Westmoreland. Now, Falstaff, where have you been all this while? When everything is ended, then you come. These tardy tricks of yours will by my life one time or other break some gallows back. I would be sorry, my lord, but it should be thus. I never knew yet but rebuke and check was the reward of valour. Do you think me a swallow, an arrow, or a bullet? Have I, in my poor and old motion, the expedition of thought? 
I have speeded hither with the very extremest inch of possibility. I have foundered nine score and odd posts, and here, travel tainted as I am, have in my pure and immaculate valour taken Sir John Colville of the Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy. But what of that? He saw me, and yielded that I may justly say with the hook-nosed fellow of Rome, I came, saw, and overcame. It was more of his courtesy than your deserving. I know not. Here he is, and here I yield him, and I beseech your grace, let it be booked with the rest of this day's deeds, or by the Lord I will have it in a particular ballad else, with mine own picture on the top on Colville kissing my foot, to the which course, if I be enforced, if you do not all show, like gilt two pences to me, and I, in the clear sky of fame, or shine you as much as the full moon doth the cinders of the element, which show like pins' heads to her, believe not the word of the noble. Therefore let me have right, and let desert mount. Thine's too heavy to mount. Let it shine, then. Thine's too thick to shine. Let it do something, my good lord, that may do me good, and call it what you will. Is thy name Colville? It is, my lord. A famous rebel art thou, Colville? And a famous true subject took him. I am, my lord, but as my betters are that led me hither. Had they been ruled by me, you should have won them dearer than you have. I know not how they sold themselves, but thou, like a kind fellow, gavest thyself away gratis, and I thank thee for thee. Re-enter Westmoreland. Now have you left pursuit? Retreat is made and execution stayed. Send Colver with his confederates to York to present execution. Blunt leave him hence, and see you guard him sure. Exit Blunt and others. And now dispatch me to the court, my lords. I hear the king my father is sore sick, and you shall go before us to his majesty, which cousin you shall bear to comfort him, and we with sober speed will follow you. My lord, I beseech you, give me leave to go through Gloucestershire, and when you come to court, stand by my good lord, pray in your good report. Fare you well, Falstaff. I, in my condition, shall better speak of you than you deserve. Exit all but Falstaff. I would you had but the wit. Twere better than your dukedom. Good faith, this same young sober-blooded boy doth not love me, nor a man cannot make him laugh. But that's no marvel. He drinks no wine. There's never none of these demure boys come to any proof, for thin drink doth so overcool their blood and making many fish-meals, that they fall into a kind of male green-sickness, and then, when they marry, they get wenches. They are generally fools and cowards, which some of us should be too, but for inflammation. A good sherry's sack hath a twofold operation in it. It ascends me into the brain dries me there all the foolish and dull and crudy vapours which environ it makes it apprehensive quick forgetive full of nimble fiery and delectable shapes which deliver it or to the voice the tongue which is the birth becomes excellent wit the second property of your excellent sherries is the warming of the blood which before cold and settled left the liver white and pale, which is the badge of pusillanimity and cowardice. But the sherries warms it, and makes it coarse from the inwards to the parts extremes. It illumineth the face, which, as a beacon, gives warning to all the rest of this little kingdom, man to arm. And then the vital commoners and inland petty spirits muster me all to their captain, the heart, who, great and puffed up with his retinue, doth any deed of courage. And this valour comes of sherries. So that skill in the weapon is nothing without sack, for that sets it to work, 
and learning a mere hoard of gold kept by a devil till sack commences it and sets it in act and use hereof comes it that prince harry is valiant for the cold blood he did naturally inherit of his father he hath like lean sterile and bare land manured husbanded and tilled with excellent endeavour of drinking good and good store of fertile sherries that he is become very hot and valiant if i had a thousand sons the first humane principle i would teach them should be to forswear thin potations and to addict themselves to sack enter bardolph how now bardolph the army is discharged all and gone let them go i'll through gloucestershire and there will i visit master robert shallow esquire i have him already tempering between my finger and my thumb and shortly will i seal with him come away exit scene four westminster the jerusalem chamber enter the king prince thomas of clarence prince humphrey of gloucester warwick and others now lords if god doth give successful end to this debate that bleedeth at our doors we will our youth lead on to higher fields and draw no swords but what are sanctified our navy is addressed our power collected our substitutes in absence well invested and everything lies level to our wish only we want a little personal strength and pause us till these rebels now afoot come underneath the yoke of government both which we doubt not but your majesties shall soon enjoy humphrey my son of gloucester where is the prince your brother i think he's gone to hunt my lord at windsor and how accompanied i do not know my lord is not his brother thomas of clarence with him no my good lord he is in presence here what would my lord and father nothing but well to thee thomas of clarence how chance thou art not with the prince thy brother he loves thee and thou dost neglect him thomas thou hast a better place in his affection than all thy brothers cherish it my boy and noble offices thou mayest effect of mediation after i am dead between his greatness and thy other brethren therefore omit him not blunt not his love nor lose the good advantage of his grace by seeming cold or careless of his will for he is gracious if he be observed he hath a tear for pity and a hand open as day for melting charity yet notwithstanding being incensed he's flint as humorous as winter and as sudden as flaws congealed in the spring of day his temper therefore must be well observed chide him for faults and do it reverently when thou perceive his blood inclined to mirth but being moody give him line and scope till that his passions like a whale on ground confound themselves with working learn this thomas and thou shalt prove a shelter to thy friends a hoop of gold to bend thy brothers in that the united vessel of their blood mingled with venom of suggestion as force per force the age will pour it in shall never leak though it do work as strong as a conitum or rash gunpowder i shall observe him with all care and love why art thou not at windsor with him thomas he is not there to-day he dines in london and how accompanied canst thou tell that with poins and other his continual followers most subject is the fattest soil to weeds and he the noble image of my youth is overspread with them therefore my grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death the blood weeps from my heart when i do shape in forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when i am sleeping with my ancestors for when his headstrong ride hath no curb when rage and hot blood are his counsellors when means and lavish manners meet together oh with what wings shall his affections fly towards fronting peril and opposed decay my gracious lord you look beyond him quite the prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue wherein to gain the language tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learnt 
which once attained your highness knows comes to no further use but to be known and hated so like gross terms the prince will in the perfectness of time cast off his followers and their memory shall as a pattern or a measure live by which his grace must met the lives of other turning past evils to advantages tis seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion enter westmoreland who's here westmoreland health to my sovereign a new happiness added to that that i am to deliver prince john your son doth kiss your grace's hand mowbray the bishop's group hastings and all are brought to the correction of your law there is not now a rebel's sword unsheathed but peace puts forth her olive everywhere the manner how this action hath been borne here at more leisure may your highness read with every course in his particular o oh, westmoreland thou art a summer bird which ever in the haunch of winter sings the lifting up of day enter harcourt look here's more news from enemies heaven keep your majesty and when they stand against you may they fall as those that i am come to tell you of the earl northumberland and the lord bardolph with a great power of english and of scots are by the shreve of yorkshire overthrown the manner and true order of the fight this packet please it you contains at large and wherefore should these good news make me sick will fortune never come with both hands full but write her fair words still in foulest letters she either gives a stomach and no food such are the poor in health or else a feast and takes away the stomach such are the rich that have abundance and enjoy it not i should rejoice now at this happy news and now my sight fails and my brain is giddy O oh, me! Come near me, now I am much ill. Comfort your majesty. O oh, my royal father! My sovereign lord, cheer up yourself, look up! Be patient, princes, you do know these fits are with his highness very ordinary. Stand from him, give him air, he'll straight be well. No, no, he cannot long hold out these pangs. The incessant care and labour of his mind hath wrought the muir that should confine it in, so thin that life looks through, and will break out. The people fear me, for they do observe unfathered airs and loathly births of nature. The seasons change their manners, as the year had found some months asleep, and leapt them over. The river hath thrice flowed, no ebb between, and the old folk, times doting chronicles, say it did so a little time before that our great-grandsire Edward sicked and died. Speak lower, princes, for the king recovers. This apoplexy will certain be his end. I pray you, take me up, and bear me hence, into some other chamber. Softly, pray. Exeunt. Scene 5 Westminster, another chamber. The king lying on a bed. Clarence, Gloucester, Warwick, and others in attendance. Let there be no noise made, my gentle friends, unless some dull and favorable hand will whisper music to my weary spirit. Call for the music in the other room. Set me the crown upon my pillow here. His eye is hollow, and he changes much. Less noise, less noise. Enter Prince Henry. Who saw the Duke of Clarence? I am here, brother, full of heaviness. How now? Reign within doors and none abroad. How doth the king? Exceeding ill. Heard he the good news yet? Tell it him. He altered much upon the hearing it. If he be sick with joy, he'll recover without physic. Not so much noise, my lords. Sweet prince, speak low. The king, your father, is disposed to sleep. Let us withdraw into the other room. Wilt please your grace to go along with us? No. I will sit and watch here by the king. Exeunt all but the prince. Why does the crown lie there, upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? Oh, polished perturbation, golden care, that keeps the ports of slumber open wide too many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. 
yet not so sound and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely biggin bound snores out the watch of night. Oh, majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that skulks with safety. By his gates of breath, there lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire that light and weightless down perforce must move? My gracious Lord, my father, this sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden regal hath divorced so many English kings. Thy due from me is tears, and heavy sorrows of the blood which nature, love, and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. My due from thee is this imperial crown, which, as immediate from thy place and blood, derives itself to me. Putting on the crown. Lo, where it sits, which God shall guard the world's whole strength into one giant arm it shall not force this lineal honor from me this from thee will i to mine leave as tis left to me exit warwick gloucester clarence re-enter warwick gloucester clarence doth the king call what would your majesty how fares your grace why did you leave me here alone my lords we left the prince my brother here, my liege, who undertook to sit and watch by you. The prince of Wales, where is he? Let me see him. He is not here. This door is open. He has gone this way. He came not through the chamber where we stayed. Where is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. The prince have taken it thence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep my death? Find him, my lord of Warwick, chide him hither. Exit Warwick. This part of his conjoins with my disease, and helps to end me. See, sons, what things you are! How quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object! For this the foolish, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with care, their bones with industry. For this they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange achieved gold. For this they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises, when, like the bee, culling from every flower the virtuous sweets, our thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey, we bring it to the hive and like the bees are murdered for our pains. This bitter taste yield his engrossments to the ending, father. Re-enter Warwick. Now, where is he that will not stay so long till his friend's sickness hath determined me? My lord, I found the prince in the next room, washing with kindly tears his gentle cheeks, with such a deep demeanour in great sorrow, that tyranny which never quaffed but blood would, by beholding him, have washed his knife with gentle eye-drops. He is coming hither. But wherefore did he take away the crown? Re-enter Prince Henry. Lo, where he comes. Come hither to me, Harry. Depart the chamber. Leave us here alone. Exit all but the king and the prince. I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was father, Harry, to that thought. I stay too long by thee, I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with my honours before thy hour be ripe? O oh, foolish youth! Thou seekest the greatness that will o'erwhelm thee. Stay but a little, for my cloud of dignity is held from falling with so weak a wind that it will quickly drop. My day is dim. Thou hast stolen that which after some few hours were thine without offence, and at my death thou hast sealed up my expectation. 
thy life did manifest thou lovest me not, and thou wilt have me die assured of it. Thou hidest a thousand daggers in thy thoughts, which thou hast wedded on thy stony heart to stab at half an hour of my life. What? Canst thou not forbear me half an hour? Then get thee gone, and dig my grave thyself, and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned. Not that I am dead. Let all the tears that should bedew my hearse be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. Only compound me with forgotten dust, give that which gave thee life unto the worms. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees, for now a time is come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is crowned. Up, vanity! Down, royal state! All you sage counsellors, hence! And to the English court assemble now, from every region, apes of idleness. Now, neighbour confines, purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways? Be happy. He will trouble you no more. England shall double gild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honour, might. For the fifth Harry from curbed license plucks the muzzle of restraint, and the wild dog shall flesh his tooth on every innocent. Oh, my poor kingdom, sick with civil blows, when that my care could not withhold thy riots, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my liege, but for my tears, the moist impediments under my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke ere you with grief had spoken, and I had heard the course of it so far. There is your crown. And he that wears the crown immortally long guarded yours. Kneeling. If I affect it more than as your honor and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise, which my most inward, true, and duteous spirit teacheth this prostrate and exterior bending. God witness with me. When I here came in and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. If I do faint, oh, let me in my present wildness die, and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed, coming to look on you, thinking you dead, and dead almost, my liege, to think you were, I, I spake unto this crown as having sense, and thus upbraided it, the care on thee, depending, hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore thou, best of gold, art worst of gold. Other less fine in carrot is more precious, preserving life in medicine potable. But thou, most fine, most honored, most renowned, hast thy bearer up. Thus, my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head, and to try with it, as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father, the quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did inflict my blood with joy, or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the might of it, let God for ever keep it from my head, and make me as the poorest vassal is, that doth with awe and terror kneel to it. O oh, my son, God put it in thy mind to take it hence, that thou mightst win the more thy father's love, pleading so wisely in excuse of it. Come hither, Harry, sit thou by my bed, and here, I think, the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son, by what by-paths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown, 
and I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with bitter quiet, better opinion, better confirmation, for all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. It seemed in me but as an honour snatched with boisterous hand, and I had many living to upbraid my gain of it by their assistances, which daily grew to quarrel and to bloodshed, wounding supposed peace. All these bold fears thou seest with peril, I have answered, for all my reign hath been but as a scene acting that argument, and now my death changes the mode, for what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. So thou the garland wearest successively, yet, though thou standest more sure than I could do, thou art not firm enough, since griefs are green, and all my friends, which thou must make thy friends, have but their stings and teeth newly taken out, by whose fell working I was first advanced, and by whose power I well might lodge a fear to be again displaced, which to avoid I cut them off, and had a purpose now to lead out many to the Holy Land, lest resting lying still might make them look too near unto my state. Therefore, my Harry, be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels, that action hence borne out may waste the memory of the former days. More would I, but my lungs are wasted so that strength of speech is utterly denied me. How I came by the crown, O oh, God forgive! and grant it may with thee in true peace live. My gracious liege, you won it, wore it, kept it, gave it me. Then plain and right must my possession be, which I, with more than with a common pain, against all the world will rightfully maintain. Enter Prince John of Lancaster, Warwick, Lords, and others. Look. Look, here comes my John of Lancaster. Health, peace, and happiness to my royal father. Thou bringest me happiness and peace, son John, but health, <laughs> alack, with youthful wings is flown from this bare withered trunk. Upon thy sight my worldly business makes a period. W where is my lord of Warwick? My lord of Warwick? Doth any name particular belong unto the lodging where I first did swoon? Tis called Jerusalem, my noble lord. Lord be to God! Even there my life must end. It hath been prophesied to me many years. I should not die but in Jerusalem, which vainly I supposed the Holy Land. But bear me to that chamber, there I'll lie. In that Jerusalem shall Harry die. Exeunt. End of Act 4. Act 5, Scene 1. Gloucestershire, Shallow's House. Enter Shallow, Falstaff, Bardolph, and Page. By cock and pie, sir, you shall not away tonight. What Davy, I say. You must excuse me, Master Robert Shallow. I will not excuse you. You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admitted. There is no excuse shall serve. You shall not be excused. Why, Davy! Enter Davy. Here, sir. Davy. 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 Let me see, Davy. Let me see, Davy. Let me see. Uh, yea, marry William Cook. Bid him come hither. Uh, sir John, you shall not be excused. Mary, sir, thus, those precepts cannot be served. And again, sir, shall we sow the headland with wheat? With red wheat, Davy. But for William Cook, are there no young pigeons? Yes, sir. Here is now the smith's note for shoeing and plough irons. Let it be cast and paid. Sir John, 
you shall not be excused now sir a new link to the bucket must needs be had sir do you mean to stop any of william's wages about the sack he lost the other day at hinckley fair he shall answer it some pigeons davy a couple of short-legged hens a joint of mutton and any pretty little tiny kickshaws tell william cook doth the man of war stay all night sir yea davy i will use him well a friend in the court is better than a penny in purse use his men well davy for they are arrant knaves and will backbite no worse than that they are backbitten sir for they have marvellous foul linen <laughs> well conceited davy about thy business davy i beseech you sir to countenance william visor of one cot against clement perks o the hill there is many complaints davy against that visor that visor is an arrant knave on my knowledge i grant your worship that he is a knave sir but yet god forbid sir but a knave should have some countenance at his friend's request an honest man sir is able to speak for himself when a knave is not i have served your worship truly sir this eight years and i cannot once or twice in a quarter bear out a knave against an honest man i have but a very little credit with your worship the knave is mine honest friend sir therefore i beseech you let him be countenanced go to i say he shall have no wrong look about davy exit davy where are you sir john come 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 off with your boots give me your hand master bardolph i am glad to see your worship i thank thee with all my heart kind master bardolph to the page and welcome my tall fellow come sir john i'll follow you good master robert shallow exit shallow bardolph look to our horses exit bardolph and page if i were sawed into quantities i should make four dozen of such bearded hermit staves as master shallow it is a wonderful thing to see the semblable coherence of his men's spirits in his they by observing of him do bear themselves like foolish justices he by conversing with them is turned into a justice-like serving-man their spirits are so married in conjunction with the participation of society that they flock together in consent like so many wild geese if i had a suit to master shallow i would humour his men with the imputation of being near their master if to his men i would curry with master shallow that no man could better command his servants it is certain that either wise bearing or ignorant carriage is caught as men take diseases one of another therefore let men take heed of their company i will devise matter enough out of this shallow to keep prince harry in continual laughter the wearing out of six fashions which is four terms or two actions and they shall laugh without intervallums <laughs> oh it is much that a lie with a slight oath and a jest with a sad brow will do with a fellow that never had the ache in his shoulders oh you shall see him laugh till his face be like a wet cloak ill laid up within sir john i come master shallow i come master shallow exit scene two westminster the palace Enter, severally, Warwick and the Lord Chief Justice. How now, my Lord Chief Justice? Whither away? How doth the King? Exceeding well. His cares are now all ended. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature, and to our purposes he lives no more. What His Majesty had called me with him, the service that I truly did his life, has left me open to all injuries indeed i think the young king loves you not i know he doth not and do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time which cannot look more hideously upon me than i have drawn in my fantasy enter lancaster clarence gloucester westmoreland and others here comes the heavy issue of dead harry 
oh that the living harry had the temper of he the worst of these three gentlemen o oh god i fear all will be overturned good morrow cousin warwick good morrow good morrow cousin we meet like men that had forgot to speak we do remember but our argument is all too heavy to admit much talk well peace be with him that hath made us heavy peace be with us lest we be heavier o oh, good my lord you have lost a friend indeed and i dare swear you borrow not that face of seeming sorrow it is sure your own though no man be assured what grace to find you stand in coldest expectation i am the sorrier would twere otherwise well you must now speak sir john falstaff fair which swims against your stream of quality sweet prince what i did i did in honour led by the impartial conduct of my soul and never shall you see that i will beg a ragged and forestalled remission if truth and upright innocency fail me i'll to the king my master that is dead and tell him who hath sent me after him here comes the prince enter king henry v attended good morrow and god save your majesty this new and gorgeous garment majesty sits not so easy on me as you think brothers you mix your sadness with some fear this is the english not the turkish court not amurath and amurath succeeds but harry harry yet be sad good brothers for by my faith it very well becomes you sorrow so royally in you appears that i will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart why then be sad but entertain no more of it good brothers than a joint burden laid upon us all for me by heaven i bid you be assured i'll be your father and your brother too let me but bear your love i'll bear your cares yet weep that harry's dead and so will i but harry lives that shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness we hope no otherwise from your majesty you all look strangely on me and you most you are i think assured i love you not i am assured if i be measured rightly your majesty hath no just cause to hate me no how might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me what rate rebuke and roughly sent to prison the immediate heir of england was this easy may this be washed in lethe and forgotten i then deduced the person of your father the image of his power lay then in me and in the administration of his law whilst i was busy for the commonwealth your highness pleased to forget my place the majesty and power of law and justice the image of the king whom i presented and struck me in my very seat of judgment whereon as an offender to your father i gave bold way to my authority and i did commit you if the deed were ill be you contented wearing now the garland to have a sun set you decrees at naught to pluck down justice from your awful bench to trip the course of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person nay more to spurn at your most royal image and mock your workings in a second body question your royal thoughts make the case yours be now the father and propose a son hear your own dignity so much profaned see your most dreadful law so loosely slighted behold yourself by a son disdained and then imagine me taking your part and in your power soft silencing your son after this cold considerance sentence me and as you are a king speak in your state what i have done that misbecame my place my person or my liege's sovereignty you are right justice 
and you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance and the sword. And I do wish your honors may increase, till you do live to see a son of mine offend you, and obey you, as I did. So shall I live to speak my father's words. Happy am I that have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son, and not less happy having such a son that would deliver up his greatness so into the hands of justice. You did commit me, for which I do commit into your hand the unstained sword that you have used to bear. With this remembrance, that you use the same with the like bold, just, and impartial spirit as you have done against me. There is my hand. You shall be as a father to my youth. My voice shall sound as you do prompt my ear, and I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced wise directions. And, princes all, believe me, I beseech you, my father is gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections, and with his spirits sadly I survive to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies, and to raise out rotten opinion, who hath writ me down after my seeming the tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and ebb back into the sea, where it shall mingle with the state of floods, and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our high court of parliament, and let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation, that war or peace or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us, in which you, Father, shall have foremost hand. Our coronation done, we will excite, as I before remembered, all our state, and God consigning to my good intents, no prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. Exeunt. Scene three. Gloucestershire, Shallow's Orchard. Enter Falstaff, Shallow, Silence, Bardolph, the Page, and Davy. Nay, you shall see my orchard, where, in an arbour, we will eat a last year's pippin of my own graffing, with a dish of caraways, and so forth. Come, cousin Silence, and then to bed. For God, you have been here a goodly dwelling and rich. Baron, 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 beggars all, beggars all, Sir John. Marry, good air, spread, Davy, spread, Davy. Well said, Davy. This Davy serves you for good uses. He is your serving man and your husband. A good varlet, a good varlet, a very good varlet, Sir John. Uh, by the mass, I've drunk too much sack at supper. A good varlet. Now, sit down. Now, sit down. Come, cousin. Ah, sirrah, quotha we shall. Do nothing but eat and make good cheer and praise God for the merry year when flesh is cheap and females dear and lusty lads roam here and there so merrily and ever among so merrily there's a merry heart good master silence i'll give you a health for that anon give master bardolph some wine davy sweet sir sit i'll be with you anon most sweet sir sit master page good master page sit Proface, what you want in meat we'll have in drink, but you must bear the heart's all. Exit. Be merry, Master Bardolph, and my little soldier there, be merry. Be merry, be merry, my wife has all, for women are shrews both short and tall. 
tis merry in hall when beards wagon and welcome merry shrove tide be merry be merry i did not think master silence had been a man of this metal who i i have been merry twice and once ere now re-enter davy to bardolph there's a dish of leather coats for you davy your worship i'll be with you straight to bardolph a cup of wine sir a cup of wine that's brisk and fine and drink unto the leman mine and the merry heart lives longer well said master silence and we shall be merry now comes in the sweet of the night health and long life to you master silence fill the cup and let it come i'll pledge you a mile to the bottom honest bardolph welcome if thou wants anything and wilt not call beshrew thy heart welcome my little tiny thief and welcome indeed too i'll drink to master bardolph and to all the caballeros about london i hope to see the london once ere i die and i might see you there davy by the mass <laughs> you'll crack a quartz together <laughs> will ye not master bardolph hey, yes sir in a pot kettle by god's liggins i thank thee the knave will stick thee i can assure thee that he will not out ee tis true bread and i'll stick by him sir why there spoke a king lack nothing be merry one knocks at door look who's at door there ho who knocks exit davy to silence who has drunk a bumper why now you have done me right do me right and up me night summingo is not so tis so is so why then say an old man can do somewhat re-enter davy and it please your worship there's one pistol come from court with news from the court let him come in enter pistol how now pistol sir john god save you what wind blew you hither pistol not the ill wind which blows no man to good sweet knight thou art now one of the greatest men in this realm bar lady i think a be but good man puff of barson puff puff in thy teeth most recreant coward base sir john i am thy pistol and thy friend and helter skelter have i rode to thee and tidings do i bring and lucky joys and golden times and happy news of price i pray thee now deliver them like a man of this world a voucher for the world and worldlings base i speak of africa and golden joys o oh, base assyrian knight what is thy news let king cofetua know the truth thereof and robin hood scarlet and john shall dunghill curs confront the helicons and shall good news be baffled then pistol lay thy head in fury's lap honest gentleman i know not your breathing why then lament therefore give me pardon sir if sir you come with news from the court i take it there's but two ways either to utter them or conceal them i am sir under the king in some authority under which king bezonian speak or die under king harry harry the fourth or fifth harry the fourth a foutra for thine office sir john thy tender lambkin now is king harry the fifth the man i speak the truth when pistol lies do this and fig me like the bragging spaniard what is the old king dead has nail indoor the things i speak are just away bardolph saddle my horse master robert shallow choose what office thou wilt in the land tis thine pistol i will double charge thee with dignities o oh, joyful day i would not take a knighthood for my fortune what do i bring good news carry master silence to bed master shallow my lord shallow be what thou wilt i am fortune's steward get all my boots we'll ride all night o oh, sweet pistol 
Away, Bardolph. Exit Bardolph. Come, Pistol, utter more to me, and with all devise something to do thyself good. Boot, boot, Master Shallow. I know the young king is sick for me. Let us take any man's horses. The laws of England are at my commandment. Blessed are they that have been my friends, and woe to my lord chief justice. Let vultures vile seize on his lungs also. Where is the life that late I led, they say? Why, here it is! Welcome these pleasant days. Exeunt. Scene four. London, a street. Enter beetles, dragging in hostess quickly, and doll tearsheet. No, thou errant knave, I would to God that I might die, that I might have thee hanged. Thou hast drawn my shoulder out of joint. The constables have delivered her over to me, and she shall have whipping cheer enough, I warrant her. There has been a man or two lately killed about her. Knock, knock, you lie. Come on, I'll tell thee what, thou damned tripe visage rascal, and the child I now go with do miscarry, thou wert better thou would struck thy mother, thou paper-faced villain. Oh, the Lord that Sir John were come, he would make this a bloody day to somebody, but I pray God the fruit of her womb miscarry. If it do, you shall have a dozen cushions again. But you have eleven now. Come, I charge you both to go with me, for the man is dead that you and Pistol beat amongst you. I tell you what, you thin man in a censer, I will have you as soundly swinged for this. You blue-bottle road, you filthy, famished correctioner, if you be not swinged, I'll forswear half curls. Come, come, you she knight errant, come. Oh, God, that right should thus overcome might. Well, of sufferance comes ease. Come, you rogue, come, bring me to a justice. Ay, come, you starved bloodhound. Goodman death, goodman bones. Thou atomy, thou. Come, you thin thing. Come, you rascal. Very well. Exeunt. Scene five. Westminster, near the abbey. Enter groom, strewing rushes. More rushes, more rushes. The trumpets have sounded twice. Twill be two o'clock ere they come from the coronation. Dispatch, dispatch. Exeunt. Trumpets sound, and the king and his train pass over the stage. After them enter Falstaff, Shallow, Pistol, Bardolph, and Page. Stand here by me, Master Robert Shallow. I will make the king do you grace. I will leer upon him as he comes by, and do but mark the countenance that he will give me. God bless thy lungs, good knight. Come here, Pistol. Stand behind me. To Shallow. Oh, if I had had to have made new liveries, I would have bestowed the thousand pound I borrowed of you. But tis no matter, this poor show doth better, this doth infer the zeal I had to see him. It doth so. It shows my earnestness of affection. It doth so. My devotion. It doth, it doth, it doth as it were to ride day and night and not to deliberate not to remember not to have patience to shift me it is best certain but to stand stained with travel and sweating with desire to see him thinking of nothing else putting all affairs else in oblivion as if there were nothing else to be done but to see him tis semper item for obsque hoc nihil est, tis all in every part. Tis so indeed. My knight, I will inflame thy noble liver and make thee rage. Thy doll, in Helen of thy noble thoughts, is in base durance and contagious prison, held thither by most mechanical and dirty hand. Rouse up revenge from Ebon Dan with fell electo's snake, for doll is in. Pistol speaks not but truth. I will deliver her. Shouts within, and the trumpets sound. There roared the sea, and trumpet clangor sounds. Enter the king and his train, the Lord Chief Justice among them. God save thy grace, King Hal, my royal Hal. The heavens thee guard and keep, most royal imp of fame. God save thee, my sweet boy. My Lord Chief Justice. Speak to that vain man. Have you your wits? Know you what is you speak? My king, my Jove, 
I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man. So surfeit swelled, so old, and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hence, and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. Know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with a fool bomb jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive, that I have turned away my former self. So will I those that kept me company. When thou dost hear I am as I have been, approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast, the tutor and the feeder of my riots. Till then I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten mile. For competence of life I will allow you, that lack of beans enforce you not to evils. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to your strength and qualities, give you advancement. Be it your charge, my lord, to see performed the tenor of our word. Exit the king and his train. Master Shallow, I owe you a thousand pounds. Yea, marry, Sir John, which I beseech you to let me have home with me. That can hardly be, Master Shallow. Do not you grieve at this. I shall be sent for in private to him. Look, you, he must seem thus to the world. Fear not your advancements. I will be the man yet that shall make you great. I cannot perceive how unless you give me your doublet and stuff me out with straw. I beseech you, good Sir John, let me have five hundred of my thousand. Sir, I will be as good as my word. This that you heard was but a colour. A colour that I fear you will die in, Sir John. Fear no colours. Go with me to dinner. Come, Lieutenant Pistol. Come, Bardolph. I shall be sent for soon at night. Re-enter Prince John, the Lord Chief Justice, with officers. Go carry Sir John Falstaff to the fleet. Take all his company along with him. My lord, my lord. I cannot now speak. I will hear you soon. Take them away. Si fortuna me tormenta, spero me contenta. Exit all but Prince John and the Lord Chief Justice. I like this fair proceeding of the king's. He hath intent his wanted followers shall all be very well provided for, but all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. And so they are. The king hath called his parliament, my lord. He hath. I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we will bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard a bird so sing whose music to my thinking pleased the king. Come, will you hence? Exit. Epilogue First my fear, then my curtsy, last my speech. My fear is your displeasure, my curtsy, my duty, and my speech to beg your pardons. If you look for a good speech now, you undo me, for what I have to say is of mine own making and what indeed i should say will i doubt prove mine own marring but to the purpose and so to the venture be it known to you as it is very well i was lately here in the end of a displeasing play to pray your patience for it and to promise you a better i meant indeed to pay you with this which if like an ill venture it come unluckily home i break and you my gentle creditors lose here I promised you I would be, and here I commit my body to your mercies. Bait me some, and I will pay you some, and, as most debtors do, promise you infinitely. And so I kneel down before you, but indeed to pray for the queen. 
If my tongue cannot entreat you to acquit me, will you command me to use my legs? And yet that were but light payment to dance out of your debt. But a good conscience will make any possible satisfaction, and so would I. All the gentlewomen here have forgiven me. If the gentlemen will not, then the gentlemen do not agree with the gentlewomen, which was never seen before in such an assembly. One word more, I beseech you. If you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story, with Sir John in it, and make you marry with fair Catherine of France, where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of a sweat, unless already I be killed with your hard opinions, for Oldcastle died a martyr, and this is not the man. My tongue is weary. When my legs are too, I will bid you good night. End of Act 5 End of the second part of Henry the Fourth by William Shakespeare.